Hello and welcome to this, our first annual um, research or disability research symposium. We are delighted that you are all here um, and that we've had such a great turnout. Uh, last I heard, we had over 100 individuals who were um, registered to participate um, in this day. I think this really speaks to the breadth of uh, research about disability health issues going on here at Michigan. And as the Center for Disability Health and Wellness, um, we're delighted because one of our uh, key missions and hopes is to better connect um, researchers throughout the University of Michigan, Michigan to allow for better collaboration. Um, if you went to our website, you know that the mission of the Center for Disability Health and Wellness is to address existing inequities for individuals with different types of disabilities through clinical care, research, and educational strategies. This type of research symposium is well one part of this. The more we learn from each other, the better we can think about applying these, implementing um, research to create better clinical care and better health outcomes for individuals with disabilities. Our vision is that all people, regardless of their type of disability, will have full access to health care along with a quality of life similar to those of people without disabilities. Unfortunately, this isn't an of course. We have numerous um, evidence uh, that individuals with disabilities receive lower quality of care, they're less satisfied with care, and they have a um, greater number of secondary and chronic health conditions. We as researchers, as a healthcare system, um, need to take responsibility for doing more about this um, and for translating everything that we learn um, in partnership with individuals individuals with disabilities into creating a health system that is responsible and relevant to these individuals and their families. Um, we are delighted that there are so many individuals who share this passion and this mindset and are working together. Um, in my name, since I didn't introduce myself, is Michelle Mead. I am uh, the co-director of the Center for Disability Health and Wellness. Together with uh, Dr. Michael McKee, uh, we are currently leading the effort um, to bring our vision to life and to bring together researchers from across the University of Michigan. With that, I'll um, let Dr. Nikki sign on, or Michael sign on, and uh, tell you a little bit about what to expect from today. Thank you, Michelle. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, so again, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this event. Um, I know we have been planning for this um, over the course of the year. And um, it's also is timely, given that we're celebrating the uh, 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and so it's really great to see many of you interested in this uh, disability health symposium. So as uh, Michelle um, alluded, that really our main objective is really to foster discussion on how research can be used to promote health functioning, participation, and quality of life for people with disabilities. Uh, we're doing a lot of cool things here at Michigan Medicine and the University of Michigan, but you know, again, as a large institution, we don't know what everyone else is doing. And so I'm hoping that this event will change that and allow us to be able to share, learn, and network with each other as well. So I have a few things I wanted to review um, in terms of the event um, as well as the schedule. So um, each one of you guys should have an agenda that has been mailed out to you. Um, so the event will be going from 8.30 to 12.30. We will have a lunch networking opportunity afterwards. Um, and that will, uh, that will come with a separate link. Um, and that's open for everyone who wants to participate. The event will also have CME credits available. Uh, the University of Michigan Medical School designated this as a live event uh, for a maximum of three AMA category one credits. Um, 
many of you are already aware, but you can apply through the my uh, MICME link. Um, if you have any questions or, or difficulties uh, getting that, let us know. I also want to make sure for those of you who do need um, captioning uh, for accessibility features, if you go down to the bottom of this Zoom uh, video, you will see closed captioning. You can activate that. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, our captioners assist us with that. So thank you again for that. Um, and then in terms of uh, what we're going to be doing for this event, we have 12 presenters who will be doing TED style talks for approximately 10 minutes. Uh, we will have um, another one or two minutes for questions and answers. Um, and anybody who is attending this event can also put in the chat box, type out their questions so that the presenters at the completion of uh, their, uh, their presentation can actually take a look at it and um, try to address hopefully um, a couple of those questions. Um, at the, um, the other thing we will be doing is uh, we will have a breakout session shortly after 10 a.m. Um, Ted will be assigning us to those uh, breakout sessions. Uh, we already have several facilitators for each one of these breakout sessions. Uh, they will have one or two uh, topics to talk about and to prompt discussions. So I, I anticipate that will be, a, that will be a, a lively discussion as well. Um, and then there will also be several short breaks uh, throughout the um, this morning. And um, I also want to just remind everybody we have an, a very exciting uh, closing speaker at noon who has tremendous experience uh, with conducting translational research. And um, so be sure to stick around for this as well. And then any who, anybody who's interested in the networking aspect, uh, we will have that um, at 1240 onward. Uh, so join us as well for that. So thank you so much. Um, and again, this is exciting to have this open up. And um, so we, uh, we, will, we have a couple minutes. Um, just Ted, any other items to uh, talk about for ground rules? Um, to all presenters, and this was included in some of the materials that we emailed earlier, um, you'll have uh, 10 minutes to present and I'll send you a private uh, chat message at nine minutes letting you know that your time is, uh, is closing. We'd like to leave about two minutes for question and answer um, and to keep everyone on track at 12 minutes, um, I will go in and, and mute you in case, you're, in case you're running a little bit over time. So try and keep the presentations to about 10 minutes or so. Um, and for facilitators, uh, please just come up with a couple questions. When you're in the breakout rooms, you'll be asked to generate conversations. Um, breakout rooms may be as many as 15 people, and so you may not have time to do introductions of everyone when you get in. We'll leave that to you to get a sense of. Um, but when people do ask questions, we ask that you say your name and your department um, that you're from or school. And just, uh, so. one, other, one other comment. Uh, for those of you who are active on Twitter, uh, we have a hashtag created, um, CDHW Research. Um, so feel free to um, you know, share a tweet about this event. <laughs> and if I could add to, um, there is also the Twitter hashtag UM Disabilities Research. So there's a couple. Uh, Finally, we ask that folks put their or set their viewing on speaker view. This will allow you to focus on the individual who is presenting and not only mute yourself, but consider muting the video as well. Um, that will allow more focus um, and less folks popping up uh, for this. Okay. I think that we are set with regard to ground rules. Um, once again, we are delighted with uh, so far 47 uh, individuals here. We know folks will be coming in and out. Um, and with that, we will uh, start. Um, our first presenter is Donna Wicker from Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. And she will be talking um, today about task lighting preference and contrast sensitivity associated with choosing 
contrast enhancing low vision devices. So uh, is, uh, we beg your patience as we make sure that we um, allow uh, Donna to okay. share her screen. I'm sharing the screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. We will uh, get that going now. This is why we have a few more minutes. <laughs> Do you want to try one more time? I think I just uh, changed that feature. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me know if there's any issue with uh, hearing me or things like that, but I will just get started. So right now, we are going to examine low vision rehabilitation services and the process of providing low vision devices um, and technology to aid our visually impaired patients in achieving their goals. So our goal is that patients achieve their goals. We want our patients to love their low vision devices and to use them daily to enhance independence. Um, so I'm starting off here with a couple of low vision devices, and I know that not everybody is familiar with these things. Um, so the gentleman on the left on the screen is wearing telescope glasses to view through distance, and then he can also view underneath. Um, and the little boy on the right is using one of our electronic portable closed circuit TVs that enhances contrast and has zoom magnification, and that's one of our contrast enhancing and lighted items. So my talk is called Task Lighting Preference and Contrast Sensitivity Associated with Choosing Contrast Enhancing Low Vision Devices. Um, Chris Andrews works in my department and is a statistician, so he did all the statistics for me. Um, Sherry Day is my coworker who saw some of the patients too when I did the chart review. Some of them were her charts that were reviewed. And Josh Ehrlich gave us uh, advice and uh, planning and information support. So who is the low vision patient? Well, our low vision patients may be legally blind and then they'd be eligible for some services through the Michigan Bureau of Services for Blind Persons. Um, and legal blindness is 2200 or worse in the better eye, and that's with the best possible glasses, or a visual field of 20 degrees or less in the better eye. So in other words, a patient could be 2020 and still be legally blind if their visual field is only 20 degrees. Um, visual impairment is usually considered 2070 or worse in the better eye with correction. Um, and Medicaid does some funding for some devices, nothing electronic, just some magnifiers, and Michigan Rehabilitation Services. So in general, the patients we see in our low vision clinic is any patient who can't accomplish a task to, to vision loss. And most of our patients are self-pay and they're buying these devices on their own. They don't necessarily fall in the categories that get help through the state or Medicaid. So we do functional vision tests so that we know where the patient stands. Um, and I wanna give this background because I know people in this audience are from all different fields. So distance visual acuity, we're all familiar with. We tend to use the lit chart on the wall now, but I included uh, myself in Jamaica doing the old fashioned visual acuity test where we just taped a chart up to the little library in the little school we were working out of. We do visual field testing as well. Um, and there are a couple of different perimeters pictured there. So that tells us how far to the side people can see and if they're missing any blind spots in the middle. Um, and then we also do a contrast sensitivity test. So most of you are probably not that familiar with contrast sensitivity, but the chart goes from a very dark bold letter to a faded letter, but all the targets are the same size. So the letters do not get any smaller, they just get faded. And this contrast sensitivity test relates to activities such as seeing curves and steps, reading menus, recognizing faces, and seeing um, cars down the road. So that's a very important functional test. And about a decade ago, we got this new equipment, which is what prompted this study, called the Lux IQ Optimal Task Lighting Test. So the patient takes the two little dials and they have two settings. They're setting how bright they like to see it and also the warmth of the color. So there could be some cool colors and some warm colors. 
So this tells us what is their optimal lighting because lighting can be so critical to a patient succeeding in accomplishing their activities. All right, so in summary about the vision loss part of it, to give you this background, um, is that the low vision patient is very varied. So we may have visually impaired patients that see things with reduced acuity, so blurry, and also have a blind spot in the middle. And yet we can also see patients who are only mildly blurred in the middle, but have peripheral loss. So the patients that we are trying to help, they vary in their functional vision loss. And that's why we do the tests of acuity, contrast sensitivity, field, and then we've added our, the lighting test um, to try to determine how each patient sees and to try to custom tailor our low vision devices to help them the best. And different diseases tend to have different um, views and pictures that the patients may have. So our goal is to try to have the patients use their vision as much as possible. Uh, so the view on the right is a 2200 legally blind view with impaired acuity and contrast, but you'll notice you can still read the number nine. You can still see that there are some objects there. So we are trying to enhance and tap into the vision the patient has to use. Um, if the patient does not have that much usable vision, then we can always do vision substitution with talking things, text to speech, and we do that as well. So our level of acuity impairment determines how much magnification is needed. Then we provide a show and tell of low vision devices and technology. So we may have a desktop closed circuit TV like on the left, a plain old magnifier that I'm holding to look at a marigold. Um, sometimes we might combine magnification in two different forms, a handheld magnifier along with a large print on an iPad or Kindle. Um, and then we also have high-tech electronics. Um, the boy on the right is using the eSight and there's a little closed circuit TV in there and he's got a controller so he can zoom up and zoom down um, and use that kind of top level technology. Um, so the study we decided to, to do is uh, a chart review study because once we got our Lux IQ equipment, we started using it on every patient. That is a weakness of this study, I must say, that we, in hindsight, we probably should have done a prospective study instead of a retrospective study um, because so many times the patient's choice of devices includes cost or other factors um, besides just what they like the best. Uh, so anyway, I did a chart review, um, 810 patients that were seen in our low vision clinic, just consecutively seen, who had all the information. So if somebody didn't complete all the tests, we did not include them. And these were patients who were seen between um, 2016 and 2018. We put them into disease categories so we can look at which different diseases were preferring different devices and which wanted contrast enhancing or lighted devices. And our disease categories are age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, optic nerve disorders, Stargardt's disease, stroke, corneal disease, albinism, and then we had a few other categories, things that didn't fit in exactly there. Uh, and our average age of our patient was 65.9, to give you a sense there. Um, so patients with some diseases are more likely to choose contrast enhancing or lighted devices. Macular degeneration is a big one that shows things a lot, but you'll notice the lowest one is stroke. And that makes sense because many of our stroke patients still have good 2020 to 2030 vision, but they're missing pieces of the visual field. So they were not, may not need something that enhances contrast because they didn't have a contrast loss to begin with. Um, so as patients had worse contrast sensitivity, they were more likely to choose contrast enhancing devices. Um, so the contrast sensitivity of a low number, zero is the worst, two is close to normal. Um, and so you can see that as people had more severe disease and worse contrast, they were more likely to need the contrast enhancing or lit devices. Um, in addition, worse acuity, they were more likely to choose contrast enhancing devices. So that acuity that I have there is the logmar acuity. And with the logmar acuity, to just give you a point of reference, zero is 2020 and 1.0 is 2200. Um, and that's how that scale goes. Um, so as acuity got worse, most often the patients needed to um, choose contrast enhancing devices. 
um, a higher brightness preference on the Lux IQ test. They were also more likely to choose contrast enhancing devices, which is just common sense, but it was a new test that came out and there were just a handful of posters and not that much uh, research based on this uh, test that has been available for about a decade. Um, so for most of the diseases, a higher contrast, they chose more contrast in enhancing devices. So as ocular disease progresses, the patients lose both the visual acuity and their contrast sensitivity. Yet some diseases have worse contrast sensitivity than others for comparable acuity loss level. Um, so to look at this graph in a little bit more detail, if we take the case of albinism and an albinism patient with a Logmar acuity of 0 0.5, which would be 2070 or so, so about the visually impaired um, level, in albinism, they had 1.6 contrast sensitivity. Yet if you look at glaucoma of that same Logmar acuity, so the glaucoma patient who was 2070, on average, they had 0 0.8 contrast sensitivity. So in our country, when we define vision impairment, legal blindness, we're using just the acuity number and occasionally the visual field. But there's so much more to the patient's vision and their quality of vision in the contrast sensitivity. So the, the logmar acuity tells us how blurry it is. The contrast sensitivity tells us how faded it is. So our patients with certain diseases, such as albinism, that 2070 albinism patient tends to have way better contrast than our 2070 glaucoma patient. So those two patients aren't equal. And that's where it comes in to play designing our low vision devices and custom choosing them for each individual's needs. Um, so instead of just considering acuity loss and predicting which devices will be chosen, we, want to see, we wanted to see if the functional tests of contrast sensitivity and our new Lux IQ task lighting preference would be helpful in choosing low vision devices. And yes, they were helpful. So that gives us an idea of helping choose things. Um, since most of these patients do not have these devices covered by insurance and they are buying them themselves, you know, perhaps if we can make this process a little bit more scientific, then we can, in the future, some hopes of getting insurance to cover these items. So the item on the left is a portable closed circuit TV, and those run about $1,000. And the one on the right that the young girl is using um, is a desktop model of a closed circuit TV, electronic magnification that enhances contrast. Um, and those run in the two to $3,000 range, depending on the um, model and the size. Um, so we, once again, our goal is that patients achieve their goals. We are trying to match up low vision devices to each patient. And right now in clinic, a lot of it is subjective preference. Just like we say, which is better one or two for the glasses? We say, which device do you like better, device one or device two? So we would like this process to be more scientific and more absolute so that we can use our functional vision tests to predict and prove what the patients will adapt to and what they will like. Um, so we want our patients to love their devices and use them daily for independence. Um, and that is the main goal of our low vision rehabilitation. And we have many different devices with lighting, without lighting um, that we match up with our patients' needs. Okay. So that is the end of my talk. I will stop the screen sharing. Wonderful. Thank you, Donna. So for you, what was the most surprising finding from the study? Well, I, we went into it expecting that if the patient had low contrast sensitivity, they would want a contrast enhancing or lit device. Um, but we wanted to figure out how to use that new test of the Lux IQ and how that was in our clinic. Um, in hindsight, I would have done a prospective study, not a retrospective, but we had 800 patients. We'd been using it in clinic. So those were expected results. But the graph that had it, the diseases with acuity and contrast, that was a little unexpected. Like I could tell you that patients with albinism do great. They accept most devices. They had, tend to have a steady vision level. It doesn't get worse. But I think seeing the contrast sensitivity along with the visual acuity that our 2070 patient of two different diseases does not have the same vision. 
We've got to factor in all of the functional vision tests of contrast, field, acuity, and lighting preference um, in order to help them as best as possible and to make our low vision rehab more scientific. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We're going to then, if there are no other questions that are coming up um, in the chat or other places, we will get prepared and bring over uh, our next speaker. Thank you again. Uh, our next speaker is Olivia Richards from the School of Information. She will be talking on shared understanding within care teams of children with emotional and behavioral disabilities. Good morning. Good morning. Here. Can you all see the main slide? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Olivia Richards. I am a second year doctoral student in the School of Information, and I work with Dr. Gabby Marcou and um, Adrian Choi, who's recently moved universities. And today I'd like to talk to you about um, shared understanding within care teams of children with emotional and behavioral disabilities. So as most of you know, um, behavioral health involves interdependent members of a care team who can provide appropriate support for children and for their behaviors that affect their physical health, their well-being, and their ability to develop interpersonal relationships. Right? However, care teams are often comprised of various, various um, individuals with different areas of expertise, knowledge, and demographics that affect their interpretations of information. And because of these differences, additional work is often needed to build a shared understanding of a child's behaviors and their needs. And, and then when care teams are additionally segmented by physical or emotional or organizational boundaries, rather, technology mediated communication is often used to coordinate care, but it can have its challenges. Thus, we, we view this problem uh, from a lens of information sharing and we look at shared understanding as an outcome that results from team members constructing and negotiating a shared mental model. But we know in practice that achieving shared understanding is difficult among distributed care teams because often of those differences among members and challenges with relying on technology mediated communication. When information is not shared, team members don't have the same mental model and struggle to develop that shared understanding. So within our context, we were interested in how people share information within care teams in order to construct a shared understanding of a care recipient's care and their well-being. We also built on Star et al's work studying boundary artifacts, which are which can be tools that members, uh, team members use to share information and coordinate care across spatial, organizational, and these knowledge boundaries. However, Vlar and colleagues have pointed out how the use of technologies as boundary artifacts can often at, and at times disrupt the transfer of information, which we would normally need to be disseminated in order to create a shared understanding. However, researchers over in uh, the information field, such as, such as our team, have provided a framework of collaborative reflection, which can describe how care teams record and use data in coordinating care. And this has also been extended to distributed care teams. It has been used to design technologies that include the care recipient and the home caregiver within this process of coordination. And in our work that I'm presenting today, we aim to understand how work practices contribute to breakdowns in the process of developing, um, in, in the process of care coordination. And what type we aim to understand what types of work practices can activate and maintain coordination while also trying to build shared understanding. Thus, in our work recently, we have looked into various research questions. However, in the interest of time today, I'm just going to talk about our third research question regarding the types of information. What types of information do different team members of a care team need from one another to develop shared understanding? 
while the rest of our work also addressed what barriers and practices are used um, for care coordination. So to, to dive into these questions, we uh, conducted 51 hours of observation in various programs in the Midwestern United States focused on children's behavioral health. And these programs were selected to represent different types of care that children might receive in various organizations and systems, such as um, the feeding disorders program, which was in a clinical setting, and the social skills program, which was in a private therapy setting, more so offsite whereas the behavior disorder program was in a school. We follow this up with 20 semi-structured interviews with behavioral therapists, specialists, educators, and parents across the various contexts um, where, where children receive, receive behavioral health care. And we asked participants questions regarding their experience coordinating care for children with emotional and behavioral disabilities, how they interact with other members of a care team, and regarding the information that they would like to be exchanged among the broader care team members, however distributed they are. And lastly, um, as for our analysis, we relied on weekly meetings, uh, affinity diagramming, memoing, and reflexive thematic analysis in order to uh, find the concept for which we conducted the rest of our analysis, which was shared understanding, and in additional, um, and, and developed our themes over time. So to share a, a bit, bit of our findings uh, through this work, we designed we designed a um, conceptual framework that describes shared understanding and care coordination from our empirical investigation of those practices that distributed care teams used. We identified the barriers to shared understanding uh, and we also generated nine practices that contribute to the development via two key mechanisms being building relationships across boundaries and sharing actionable information. As I mentioned previously in the interest of time, I won't get to discuss the barriers and the granularity of the specific practices, but I'd be happy to chat more offline. So I'd like to discuss um, the types of information that care team members needed uh, to provide the best care possible. And first, um, and them being prescriptive and descriptive information. So I'd like to describe them for you all, um, where prescriptive information serves to teach or inform so that members of the care team can deliver consistent care across the various settings. Prescriptive information sharing involved more knowledgeable members of the care team training others to implement an intervention effectively no matter the um, location. For example, um, practitioners trained home caregivers to deliver behavioral interventions through an experiment, experiential learning process. And similarly, senior behavioral therapists offered feedback and practical advice to junior therapists on how to improve their delivery of care after, um, after time uh, observing through some, type of, some types of intra-organizational communication. In contrast, descriptive information was also shared by distributed core, uh, care teams. And we define descriptive information to be more contextual or holistic knowledge about the context for which the child was receiving care and that the intervention was being applied. Um, to share descriptive information, team members had to um, really give an intentional effort and it often required a work working relationship and because this information was contextual and couldn't easily be captured through data and shared, we found that descriptive information sharing required team members to physically be together, which has its challenges right now, and meet in person and through group communication and employ collaborative practices with the intention of understanding ch the child's experience and care across settings through um, methods such as welcoming other team members into their respective settings for observation and learning, or sharing critical information by parents at pick up or drop off so that there was more cohesive care across settings. So to give you a little bit of an idea of, uh, of 
what we emphasized from our findings, um, we, we truly found how it is necessary to build relationships and share different types of information, the prescriptive and descriptive information that is actionable across boundaries so that folks can improve their practices and improve outcomes for children. Our framework emphasizes how various collaborative practices can be incorporated into the design of future artifacts in order to more effectively engage distributed care team members. And our findings show how the quality of complex information can decrease when it is transferred secondhand. And this has implications for the design of artifacts um, to reinforce the impact of specific practices and deflect the impacts of barriers to, um, to the development of care coordination. So I thank you so much for the time in having me today and I welcome all of your any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Olivia, for your very interesting presentation. Um, I know I have a couple questions related to it, um, but can you start with, I guess, speaking to the role of uh, researchers from the School of Information and what you bring or how you can help enhance the clinical care practice? Well, I think what what we can see is we, we have this eye for the the breakdowns in in coordination happening and how technology can kind of bridge the gaps between um, and bridge the understand lack of understanding right and make sure that there is consistent flow of information i feel as though um, information researchers can identify those challenges and you know provide some type of uh, of, of solutions to figuring out how how any artifacts might help um, better promote outcomes. And what do you mean when you say artifacts? Right. So I we often use artifacts that could be anything from uh, you know a piece of paper that is as laminated and can be uh, you know written on in a hand, a patient handoff, right, uh, or a whiteboard or something, and then that can all transfer all the way over to a um, a technological intervention where you know we have an iPad application, a mobile application, and all of the folks who are working with a the patient then can access that. Um, technological information. So the artifact can be something without technology or completely technical. And um, other, I don't want to dominate this. So if there are other questions, feel free to unmute if you can or put in the chat. Um, but did you come up with solutions or were you able to ask that you worked with solutions based on this? Yeah, definitely. Um, most of the most of what we're working, this, this paper works under a review. Um, most of what we had shared with respect to specific um, ways that information won't be lost, that we can have effective handoffs and sharing, right? And some of that can be done through, um, for example, scaffolding inter uh, interactions between parents and providers so that information isn't lost. If a, you know, a, a child hadn't eaten or slept the previous night, they want to share that information. But if somebody else drops the child off at a clinic or at school, that information not, might not be transferred. So if, if technology can support and provide opportunities for uh, anyone on the care team to share information and that it's visible to all, hopefully more um, granular or complex information can be preserved. And I totally see now, see there's questions in chat. I don't know how much time we have left, Michelle. <laughs> you have about one minute. We were, we started a little bit early. So if you want to take that. So someone said complex care managers and someone else said the, are there key players or strategies for primary care providers to ensure that it is okay? For, for um, PC, Piece, I would I would say, um, for example, one of the the practices that several uh, providers were using was just more inter organizational communication where, you know, folks are communicating with the specialists with the educators and just ensuring that there is a shared understanding across these um, Across the boundaries. Right. Because that's that's where the, the, the loss occurs and 
um, I know the question went on to how, how it occurs effectively, right? It's, it's fluid and proactive. And I think that was the difference among um, the, the care teams that, were, that felt that they were successful was that they were talking before there was a problem right? They were, they, were, they were able to make these communications. They had a working relationship and they were able to then properly, uh, you know, work together and collaborate as things unfolded versus, oh, I don't know you and there's a problem and now we can, we can better address, um, address the challenges that a child might be facing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I imagine this is especially important today as we're communicating differently on a regular basis. So we'll look forward to talking more during the breakout groups. With that, um, I would like to introduce our next presenter, Neil Kamadar. He is from the Institute of Healthcare Policy and Innovation, and he will be talking about heightened risk of early onset Alzheimer's disease among adults with cerebral palsy, spina bifida, multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injury. Neil, um, let's get you uh, on screen and then allow you to share and present. Thank you, Michelle. Um, let's see. So I'm gonna talk about um, you know, congenital or acquired physical disability conditions that affect, you know, central nervous system. And we're looking at instant Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Um, this is uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. El Mamoudi, who couldn't be here to uh, present this work. So I'm presenting a lot of this on her behalf. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the co-investigators um, and colleagues uh, who are part of this work and have um, definitely improve the quality of the, with all their inputs. And, um, you know, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge funding from the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. So we're just gonna go through an overview of all, you know, all the different aspects of this study. In terms of background, you know, cerebral palsy and spina bifida are congenital conditions. Uh, they're known to cause, you know, array of uh, permanent, uh, movement uh, uh, permanent movement disorders. There's, um, you know, incidence of, you know, 2 to 2.5 per thousand for CP and 1 per 3,000 for spina bifida. Um, over the years, life expectancy for people with these conditions has improved over time. We're also going to look at multiple sclerosis, um, which is a chronic inflammatory disease. Um, it's usually diagnosed between ages 20, between the ages of 20 and 40, um, and neuroinflammation is a prominent feature for MS. So we're also going to look at, finally, as our third disability condition, traumatic spinal cord injury. Um, so usually by you know, vehicle accidents, falls, or acts of violence and neuronal damage, you know, could, um, you know, could imply that over time they develop, uh, you know, incident Alzheimer's. And so what we know about these conditions is that, you know, for uh, cerebral palsy and spina bif bifida, it's been mainly focused on, you know, pediatric or, you know, under 18 population, although recent work with one of our colleagues, uh, Mark Peterson, has indicated now, you know, some similar kinds of work going on now in the adult population. And then there's uh, similarities between um, MS and Alzheimer's. And so results from clinical trials have been mixed and sample sizes have been small. And then for traumatic spinal cord injury, it's basically been, um, you know, studies have looked at physical rather than cognitive functions. And so preval prevalence and incidence of Cardiometabolic, psychological, and musculoskeletal conditions you know, are higher among those with each of these three physical disabilities compared to their you know, adult counterparts. There's a higher prevalence of these conditions that have been also linked to Alzheimer's. So the aims, the objective of the study was to examine time to diagnosis of and adjusted hazard ratios for Alzheimer's, comparing adults with and without uh, each of these disability conditions. 
comparing the risk with a matched cohort of adults without any disability. So in terms of the data set, so uh, we used uh, commercial insurance claims from Optum Insight, which represents a single private payer. Uh, we used uh, you know, the study period from 2007 to 2017. These are final action adjudicated claims for a patient population we restricted to age 45 and above at the time of enrollment with a diagnosis of any of these conditions. So we had three different cohorts of interest at any point during their study period. And the patients had no prior Alzheimer's in the one year uh, you know, pr prior to their, uh, what we would call their you know, diagnosis of each of these disabilities. So our patient population included, uh, you know, for our unmatched versus matched, you know, for disabilities, there are cases, we had a relatively small number of cases um, that fit the criteria where we required a certain amount of insurance enrollment, um, either four or five years of continuous uh, insurance enrollment, dependent upon if it was congenital, so if it was CP or spina bifida or, um, acquired with MS or traumatic CI. So you can see these are the case counts in the, you know, between six and 7,000 for cases. And then our controls were a 5% a, a random sample of controls for which we checked against the base population to, to determine on baseline covariates if there was any bias introduced. The study design, we had an outcome of instant Alzheimer's within a four-year time horizon. Our independent variables included age, sex, race, and ethnicity, and U.S. Census division. There's nine of those divisions. Health included, you know, any IC9 or IC10 diagnosis of cardiometabolic, psychologic, and musculoskeletal skeletal conditions during the one-year look-back period. So this is the one year before their um, you know, their diagnosis of the disability or one year into their enrollment for the congenital condition since they're already, already prevalent at the time of enrollment since they acquired this in childhood. Socioeconomic variables included net worth and educational attainment. We use survival models to quantify unadjusted, um, fully adjusted and propensity matched, unadjusted and adjusted hazard ratios for instant ADRD. We use Weibull survival models um, based on model fit tests. Uh, and then we also implemented propensity score matching with calipers uh, using the prevalent conditions in the one year look back period for each of these various classes of variables as matching covariates. The match analysis included looking at propensity score matched unadjusted, which included the four-year ADRD outcome, and then exposure or the disability only as a covariate. And then we also did a propensity score matched adjusted ADRD outcome and exposure or the disability group and the vector of the covariates of interest that we actually used initially for matching as well. So we sort of, in a, in a certain respect, over-adjusted uh, for, uh, for various uh, risk factors. So in our results, we looked at each of these cohorts individually. So for CP spina bifida, we noticed that actually one of the key, key components here is while when we stratify by age, we noticed that for younger age groups, you're seeing a much higher uh, you know, incident Alzheimer's compared to those who are in the control group. So the difference or the, you know, we would predict that the hazard ratios are much higher actually for the younger age groups than we see for the older ones. Although in all cases, we see a higher risk and a, and a higher incidence of ADRD compared to their control group. And these are the Kaplan-Meier curves looking at, in this case, three years, uh, three year time horizon for, because this is a congen congenital disorder. And so we noticed that for the cases we're seeing, which is highlighted in blue, that represents CP, they have a, a, a poorer trajectory in disease-free survival. So they're more likely over time to develop Alzheimer's and related dementia, whether in the unmatched or the matched cohorts. 
The same is true for MS. So we also notice that for MS, there's a much higher incidence of ADRD compared to their control group. And we're seeing that even here, it's even more pronounced. The differences are between the, for 45 to 64, for unmatched and matched. And you can see that the differences of, say, for instance, for 65, 4% 4, 4 versus 3.3, and four versus 3%, there's still a slight um, increase in incidence if you have MS. The same, uh, you know, same trends we see for unmatched and matched cohorts for um, MS in disease-free survival for Alzheimer's. And then we also looked at traumatic spinal cord injury where the biggest differences in this case were seen in the 65 plus population where, you know, you know, on the order of a threefold or fourfold increase. And here you can see that you know, there's a quite a substantial difference in the KM curves over time, where the cases or those of traumatic SCI have a poor trajectory. And then the hazard ratios. So uh, here we have unadjusted and adjusted hazard ratios of interest, and in that. Um, the unadjusted, we're showing that, you know, it's a basically just the main exposure variable in the unmatched cohort. And we performed full adjustment. And in all of these cases, we noticed that, um, you know, those who have uh, the disability are more likely to go and get incident ADRD. Although consistent across all of these groups is the fact that, uh, for ages 45 to 64, we're seeing basically a higher risk of early onset, onset Alzheimer's. And so, conclusions are that both middle age and older adults with these disability conditions had higher incident ADRD, and that fully adjusted survival models indicated that the adults with aforementioned disabilities had a greater hazard ratio for Alzheimer's. Uh, limitations, we have lack of more granular socioeconomic data, uh, lack of a measure, uh, you know, lack of measure for cognitive function. There's an underdiagnosis in claims for Alzheimer's. Uh, we don't really even know the severity of disease for them. Um, it's also hard to define an index diagnosis of comorbid conditions and or identifying incident or prevalent conditions. The results are not necessarily representative of the US population. We know that a lot of these people are probably on Medicare, Medicaid with disability entitlements. So we're only looking at a, a, a subset of all of these disabled folks. There's a selection bias of the inclusion of privately insured with higher income and education. Policy implications that there's no cure for Alzheimer's. There's a you know, variety of diet, lifestyle, and you know, therapeutic. Um, interventions that may slow down onset of Alzheimer's or preserve level of cognitive function and improved, you know, clinical screening and early intervention or detection, you know, can be aimed to preserve cognitive function or even delay onset. Um, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Very interesting uh, presentation. And so you you noted the the uh, that um, this group and, uh, of privately insured individuals had early all of them were more likely to have early onset uh, or just the onset of Alzheimer's disease um, uh, given these serious physical impairments. Um, what would you like to do, or how? What would this mean? clinically or with education? Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, clinically or with education, you know, to potentially, um, you know, identify for those who are, especially in these lower age brackets, to do, you know, more, you know, more exhaustive, you know, physical therapy or rehabilitative treatments that may not necessarily be done in this population as you know, it's probably a little different in the VA, but over here among those that are you know, privately insured, I think that we want to be able to, you know, 
spend the necessary resources to delay this onset. I mean, we saw in the, you know, if you're 45 years of age with this disability, that this is actually very problematic in terms of their difference in risk for, for incident ADRD. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this in the breakout groups. Uh, I'm delighted to have our next presenter, Patricia Anderson, coming from the university library system. Uh, Patricia will be talking about HPV screening in women with disabilities, a scoping review, search challenges, in a narrow research base. Patricia? Thank you. Next slide. Diane Harper knew there was a problem. She knew because women, specifically women with disabilities, were coming into her clinic with a mostly preventable cancer. Diane Harper knew there was a solution. Many of these women wouldn't have had that cancer if they had just had screening tests, like a pap test, early enough and often enough. Then the abnormal cells would have been found before they became cancer. I knew about this problem and solution too, because three years earlier, one of my closest friends died of the same entirely preventable cancer cervical cancer. Next slide. Between the problem and the solution lies a gap. A gap that includes more problems, policies, resources, actions, answers, questions. Between the questions and the answers lies another gap, information. Or more precisely, evidence to be able to answer questions, to be able to find the best answers, to choose the best actions, allocate needed resources, change outdated policies. There has to be evidence. And most importantly, you need to be able to find the evidence. Next slide. When Diane came to me, she had an idea and one article. One. One is a rather dramatic number. The news media, especially right now, often get terribly excited over one article if that article makes a good headline. But in the real world of doctoring and insurance and policy making, one article is a bit like one grain of sand. You want to build a sandcastle but you aren't anywhere near a beach, and the sand is scattered all over the playground. You can't even find enough sand to fill a bucket. If you had a beach load of articles, no one would be asking the question anymore. They'd be deep into the fix. But with a bucket full, that's enough to tip the balance, to make a difference, to start, hopefully, to shift policies and practices. This is exactly the sort of challenge that systematic reviews were designed for, to discover if there is a bucket full of research on a given question, and if that research is black, white, gray, or a mix. I'll save you some time. It's always a mix. I'll save you some more time. The first time a systematic review is published on a question, most of them have the same answer, insufficient evidence. So why do we do it? Because with a bucket of evidence, you can start to actually have conversations about how important the question is. Are there genuine possibilities? Where are the weak spots? Where are the strong spots? Is there hope for a solution? With a bucket of evidence, you can start to sift and sort and say, it's mostly white, it's mostly black, well, it's kind of gray. And if people did research with just these few changes, maybe we could find that answer. And then the researchers in the rest of the world do what was recommended, the findings 
and a few years later, we can start to get enough of one kind of research for that color to shine out. So Diane had one article. She needed more. And we found more. But to find more felt less like playing in a sandbox on the, on the playground and more like playing tag on a jungle gym. Crazy, complicated. So here's what we did. Of course, next slide, there needs to be a team. Diane invited people, so did I. We spent time learning about systematic and scoping review methods. We carefully framed a good question to try to answer. We looked at examples of protocols and processes. We considered ways to minimize bias at all steps of the process. We identified and selected sentinel articles to use to test and validate the search. We identified concept clusters and structured an approach to use in developing the search strategy because it helps a lot to know what you're looking for when and when you found it, we identified definitions we could depend upon for the core terms in the concept clusters. Well, we tried to define the terms. We kind of got stuck there. You would think everyone knows what it means to say women with physical disabilities. You would think it was easy to agree on what it means to say woman. It took a bit of discussion, but we sorted that one out. But defining physical disabilities proved much more difficult. First, the easy part. Physical disabilities are different from learning disabilities or psychological disabilities. Then we found ourselves deciding unilaterally that blindness and deafness are not physical disabilities, but sensory disabilities. Then we found ourselves in conversations like this. Is Parkinson's a physical disability? I guess it could be. If you include Parkinson's, what about multiple sclerosis or essential tremor? What about drug-induced tremors? Do you consider only inborn disabilities? Should we include acquired disabilities? Do you include amputees? Where do you draw the line to decide if you include chronic conditions and pain disorders and which ones and how severe do they need to be? How would you measure this or assess it? What if the condition is episodic or temporary? When is an illness a disability or vice versa? Do you trust diagnostic categories in clinic records? to accurately identify patients to include? Do you depend instead on functionality, like whether or not they can climb on an examining table? What exactly does it mean when you say physical disabilities? It turns out we weren't sure. We knew to avoid bias and truly represent this concept fairly and equitably, we needed some sort of authoritative master source for a definition of physical disability and which also discriminates physical disability from other forms of disability. We looked nationally, Medicaid, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the US Code, Department of Labor, CDC, NIH, Office of the Surgeon General, the Institute of Medicine, Job Accommodation Network, Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, other disability surveys. Mm. We went international and we looked at the World Health Organization and through the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. The World Bank, United Nations, UNESCO, the International Paralympic Committee. We even went local and checked the state of Michigan disability resources, guidelines, legislation. Wikipedia had a definition. Finally, we went hyperlocal and we asked Claire and Michelle. That worked. You know, we really thought that would be easier. It should be, shouldn't it? 
something like official definitions of disability categories and what they mean, that should already exist. There are good resources for supporting asking questions about disability broadly, for assessing functioning of individual people or in specific situations. But there is a real need for something in the middle, something that will help researchers like all of us ask and answer questions about categories of disabilities that have shared experiences and concerns, categories that can shape and inform and support the process of asking the questions we need to ask. So at last, we were finally ready to start drafting a search strategy to find more articles, we hoped. Going back to the formula for the proposed search strategy, we got the team together, brainstormed lists of relevant terms to describe the concepts, each concept broken down into all kinds of sub concepts. Um, one of the aspects of systematic review searching that surprises some people is that when you have a big research base, it's not too hard to develop a good search strategy fairly quickly and it doesn't have to be very complicated. But the smaller the research base, the less evidence exists, the harder you have to work to find it and the longer the search strategies tend to be. So we brainstormed a lot for a long time. We draft and run a search, test it, test it with for sensitivity and specificity and go back and do it again and again. And each time we realize something got left out, like data sources for disability research, journals publishing specifically on our question, or even a little psychology term related to cervical cancer screening that we would add in at the last minute. One of the biggest problems we had with this part of the process was terms for self-sampling for HPV screening, which was the area that Diane was most interested in for this question. And that gets back to why we were doing this in the first place. Okay, HPV means human papillomavirus. This is the main cause of cervical cancer. In the past, the most common way to find if HPV caused damage to the cells was to swab the cervix for cells, the famous pap test. Now we know that testing for HPV itself is a much more sensitive test and only requires a vaginal swab or maybe even just a small dry spot of urine. And Patricia, we're going to have to leave this. Do you want to just bring down to the last screen? We have to go on and say one final word and then we'll go on to our next speaker. Okay, so lots of reasons why people have trouble with pap testing. We were including self-sampling. This is examples of what we went through to do the term generation process. And what we ended up with was a search strategy over 200 lines long and found right around 500 articles. It took 12 tries to get a search strategy that worked. And now we have that bucket full that we can start to work with to try to answer the question. Very dramatic presentation, Patricia, and very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we would like to introduce our next speaker um, is Yu Yang Fei from- Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Yes. Um, so I apologize. We're having some technical issues with the captionists. Um, Ted, if you're able, since you're uh, the host to see, we can try to reassign our captionists back on. Um, until then, I'm going to be sharing a, um, a stream link text. Um, that will be a separate window to allow us to look at the captioning. So I apologize for that, but I just want everyone to be aware, especially those who are so, um, who need the, uh, the captioning. Okay, thank you. And I'm actually looking for our next speaker. Oh, there he is. I'm here. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, are you, Would you like me to share my screen? If you could, and yeah. uh, 
you'll be talking about preparing for puberty in girls with special needs, caregiver concerns, and patient outcomes. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm delighted to be amongst so many amazing discussions. Today, today we're going to talk a little bit about puberty, specifically puberty in girls. We all know about puberty. So we know it's scheduled events. Puberty is scary. Suddenly your friends are four inches taller. Your own body is changing. Adults are talking about your emotions. It's likely that these pubertal changes are actually more terrifying for the patient, for the parents and caregivers than they are for the girls themselves. Girls just kind of take it in stride as a part of growing up. But as adults, we think it's something that we can save them from or um, help them with. It's scary before it happens, it's scary when it's happening, and it's scary when it doesn't happen. Girls also have an extra dragon to overcome menstruation. In an effort to understand the families of girls with developmental delay and disability and their specific concerns, we recently did a retrospective study looking at visits over the past 10 years to two of our specialized gynecology clinics where we see the majority of adolescents and women with disabilities who present for reproductive health care. Out of the 478 patients in this cohort, one out of eight, about 61 girls, presented at one point for anticipatory guidance and counseling of puberty before the onset of periods. These girls came to our clinics on average 13 and a half months before menarche. By that time, most of them had already started the pubertal transition, so had likely seen other general pediatric or specialty clinics regarding these concerns and then were subsequently referred to gynecology to discuss further. Menarche, or the start of periods, is a huge deal and is something that is on the forefront of families' minds way before it actually happens. We found that this group included a much higher proportion of patients with autism spectrum disorder and or ADHD ADHD in girls who are nonverbal. Almost 30% of patients also came back for an additional premenarchal visit for further counseling and guidance of the same concerns. So what do we talk about at these visits and how can we help them? We talk about puberty being a normal stage of development is when adolescents start growing taller, when their bodies start changing. Unfortunately, it doesn't wait until a child or adolescent is emotionally and physically ready. Wouldn't that be nice? Changes start happening, at first imperceptibly but becoming more obvious over time. Therefore, it is a topic that should be addressed early and often for girls with special needs so that families have time to prepare. Menstruation usually starts about two, two and a half years after initial breast development. Average age of menarche in our study was 12.6 years, pretty consistent with the 12.4 years in the general population. Slightly more than half of our girls experienced irregular cycles initially mostly due to immaturity of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian or HPO access, also consistent with the general population. For those of us who have a hard time remembering the HPO access, it starts with the hypothalamus releasing GnRH, stimulating the pituitary to release LH and FSH, which then stimulates ovaries to release estrogen, progesterone, and other hormones. These hormones drive puberty and menstrual cycles. Well, they say, I'm fine with the rest of it, but why does she have to have periods? Can't we just nip that in the bud? We tell the parents and caregivers that suppressing the menstrual cycles is eventually an option, but we prefer to have girls have at least a few periods. And she may really surprise you on how well she handles them. It's not that we want the girls to suffer, but having periods tells us so much about the functionality of the reproductive organs, patency of the reproductive tract, and the communication between the brain and the ovaries. Therefore, we generally do not start hormones prior to menarche. We talk to girls and families about practicing with menstrual pads at home before they are needed so that they have time to get used to them. One thing that has also been almost life-changing for some families, absorbent period underwear. Things came out with some of the original options a few years ago, and since then, so many more companies NYX, Lunapads, Proof, DK8 have come out with many more options. They look and feel like normal underwear, but can hold several tampons worth of menstrual blood. They even have disposable ones. Especially for girls with hygiene or sensory challenges, these have been revolutionary. In this study, we also explored what specific questions parents want to discuss. In addition to general guidance regarding puberty and menstruation, 
half were concerned about potential behavior changes. Slightly more than a fourth were worried, uh, were brought up the fear of unrecognized discomfort with menstrual cramping. And almost one fifth were worried about hygiene issues. Timing of pubertal changes and the safety issues were also frequent concerns. Unfortunately, we don't know how every girl is going to change or not change with puberty. Every girl is different, and I wish we had a crystal ball that could lay out all the answers. But we can reassure families that they are often pleasantly surprised to how well their daughters handle periods. So what happened to the girls in our study? 20% ultimately chose to never initiate hormones for menstrual suppression, which is more than has been previously reported. This shows that visits for anticipatory guidance and education can help families plan for menstrual management. It is important to set expectations, address caregiver concerns, discuss options for menstrual management, and encourage practicing with menstrual hygiene supplies. This allows a significant proportion of girls to progress to puberty without any interventions. The other 80% who did request to start hormones mostly chose to do so to help with irregular or heavy bleeding hygiene issues, and dysmenorrhea, or painful cramping. They started an average of 7.2 months after menarche. When discussing options for menstrual suppression, we talked about interactions with medications, current height, other medical issues, and desired menstrual pattern outcome. Patients and families were also able to easily switch to another option if they were not satisfied. 20% ultimately chose to use combined oral contraceptives, 20% chose oral progestins, and 30% the levonorgestrel intrauterine device, or the Mirena IUD. IUD was also increased over the study period. This is obviously a more invasive method, especially in this population, since 90% of our IUDs were placed under anesthesia in the operating room. So families that were initially reluctant to start with the IUD eventually became more open to it after first being dissatisfied with another option or two. No patients ultimately needed a hysterectomy or endometrial ablation. 96% were happy with the final bleeding outcomes. One third were able to achieve amenorrhea or complete cessation of periods, and almost one third had lighter, regular periods. Overall, this study describes the important role of premarital counseling for girls with disabilities especially those with autism spectrum disorder and ADD, ADHD, as well as patients who are nonverbal. Providers should realize that this is a source of anxiety for patients and families, and therefore an important topic to bring up early, probably as soon as any breast development is noted. Families and patients are often surprised in how well the girls can handle their menses, following the appropriate anticipatory counseling. We hope that this study helps elucidate some common concerns and outcomes so providers feel more comfortable with counseling on this important topic. And Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions or feel free to shoot me an email or any, anything like that. And unfortunately, we do not have questions right now, um, but uh, please put some in the chat and uh, if you can stay on and respond to any that come up in the chat, that would be wonderful. Our next presentation is by Rebecca Parton. Um, let me make sure we... Uh, Rebecca uh, is from the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and she will be talking about the U of M program for research on women's health and disability. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. So let me just pull up my screen so you can see my slides. Okay. Here we go. Um, so um, like Michelle said, uh, my name is Rebecca Parton um, and I work within the physical medicine and rehab department um, uh, on the U of M program for research on Women's Health and Disability, or UM Proud. So who are we? We are a group of researchers from a variety of different fields, um, such as we have psychology, neuropsychology, gynecology, social work, 
working together to improve the gynecological and reproductive health care of women with disabilities by creating tools that enhance communication, knowledge, and decision making. Um, our uh, program director is Claire Kalpachian, um, who is a um, rehab uh, psychologist um, by trade, and uh, she has a, a long standing interest in women's health issues for women with disabilities. Um, our projects uh, include developing a clinically relevant outcome measure uh, for women's health and disability, and that's what we're working on right now. And basically, what we want to do is we want to create a tool that women with disabilities uh, can use when talking with their doctors about uh, topics such as um, pregnancy decision making, um, period management, um, having pelvic exams, all these kinds of things that we know can be um, stressful and overwhelming for anyone, but even more so when you are a woman with a disability. So we want to create this tool to help kind of guide conversations and um, make accessing women's health care a little bit easier for women with disabilities. Um, we also have two very similar projects um, related to developing a pregnancy decision-making tool. Um, one is for women with physical disabilities. The other is specifically for women with spinal cord injury. So this kind of um, helps to guide a woman through thinking about the different aspects of um, pregnancy, helping them to think about things like how will becoming pregnant affect their physical functioning, for example. Um, and we're really excited uh, about this, about both of these um, tools because we know that, you know, making the decision on whether or not to become pregnant is uh, complicated enough, again, for women without disabilities, but there's just so much more that women with disabilities have to think about. Um, another project that um, we have done in the past is related to the menopause transition in women with traumatic brain injuries, looking at, you know, how that whole transition experience is for women with TDI compared to their peers without TBI. Um, and then we also have just a general women's health and disability research registry where women can sign up saying, hey, I'm interested in your work. Um, please reach out to me as you have new studies available. So one thing, what I wanted to focus on in my presentation is the importance of developing a communication plan. Um, my role within the team has to do with recruitment, outreach, engagement with study uh, participants, all that kind of thing. And something that we've found to be very helpful is to create a communication plan. You may have heard of this in terms of like PR, uh, professionals, but my goal from this presentation is to emphasize the fact that they can be very helpful for research teams as well. So the different types of things that we've, that I put together 
um, in our plan is identifying our different audiences and stakeholders, um, describing our deliverable types, um, our communication focus areas, branding, different tools that we can utilize, um, evaluation metrics, and then specific policies, boilerplate text, that kind of thing. So in the describing deliverables section, for example, we would write about uh, the type of deliverable, the benefits of it, and things to consider. So for example, we have an email newsletter that we send out um, periodically. So we would put in this document, you know, MailChimp newsletter, the benefits are the easy, low cost way to uh, communicate study updates with our participants. Um, things to consider are accessibility concerns. We wanna make sure that there is a um, text only version available. Um, in the describing uh, communication focus area section, we would kind of outline um, the specific audience, strategies for communicating with them, key performance indicators, specific deliverables that we might use with them, and other resources. So an example might be, um, you know, we really want to focus on study recruitment. So the audience would be, you know, potential study participants, strategies for communicating with them, um, might be doing like social media ads through Mishar or um, posting in social media groups, um, which is something we found to be very helpful. Um, key performance indicator would be actual enrollment numbers. Deliverables um, could be study flyers um, and other resources that I might put in the section would be like, um, like using Canva, which is a graphic design tool. Um, so I put a link to Canva, which is where I can create our different flyers and social media graphics. In the branding section, talk about our main message, who we are, talking points, specifically by audience, because it's important to remember that the things that you want to emphasize with your participants are going to be different than, say, if we're talking to other researchers. Um, and then I would also include information um, about specific logos that you'd use, like the Michigan Medicine logo versus U of M logo, colors, fonts. So this kind of just serves as an outline of, you know, um, this is who we are and can really serve as a way to make sure that everybody on the team is being consistent with how you're presenting your research projects. Um, in the tools to utilize section, um, again, this serves as kind of a, a roadmap of like how you would use specific tools. So talking about frequency, priority, what audiences you're trying to reach, what types of content, themes um, you're posting or describing in these, um, using these different tools, other resources. Um, under evaluation metrics, um, you can uh, identify what you want to track, which can be really helpful to identify 
you know, from the get-go. Um, and this can be also helpful for when you're, you know, putting together reports um, or like grant updates. Um, and these are just some examples of things that you could track. Um, there is a really great resource on the U of M Library website um, that describes all of these. Um, and so if you go onto the U of M website and um, I think just search for like the research impact uh, like guide, um, all this information should come up. So a practical example from our work is MailChimp. Um, we use MailChimp for a couple different uh, use, like a um, couple different ways. Um, we use it to send out our study um, update emails with currently enrolled uh, participants. Um, and then we have landing pages, which are like very small focused um, mini sites. Um, and so how we use that, for example, is we'll have a landing page uh, with all of our different flyers that people can download um, in PDF format, as well as graphics um, properly sized for social media that people can download and post on their own social media profiles um, and in their networks, like the different groups. And this has been very helpful for us in terms of recruitment. Wonderful, because, Rebecca. Um, okay. Unfortunately, yes. it's, your time's up. I guess one uh, for any last comments in terms of either thoughts about reaching individuals with disabilities or things that you have found most rewarding before we go to break out. Um, okay, sorry about this last slide, with that typo. Um, I think we uh, have just found it to be very helpful um, to encourage women with disabilities to share our information with their peers. And that has been, you know, a great way for us to increase our study numbers. Um, and feel free to reach out to me via email um, if you'd like more information on how we set up our plan. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we're now going to begin to move to breakout sessions. Um, I don't know how fast this process will go be going. I ask that the facilitators introduce themselves once the breakout sessions start. Um, and pose questions. Uh, if the everyone else there, please unmute yourself and put yourself on video. Um, and it may be that you don't introduce yourself up front, but as you propose a question or respond to a question, please do so, um, saying your name and your department or school. Um, we look forward to you talking about these really interesting and fascinating presentations and how they may impact the education that we provide, um, or clinical care, or community programs, once again, to work about increasing equity for individuals with disabilities and their access to health care. If you have any problems, please uh, feel free to uh, put questions to myself or Ted Allaire in the chat. The, um, the only thing I'll add about the breakout rooms, like Michelle said, we had about 100 folks register, and so I've assigned 100 people to be evenly distributed. Um, we're at about 44 folks on the call right now, so I'm going to do my best to rearrange people in the rooms after I, um, after I start them to make sure we have an even distribution. So don't be surprised if you um, are assigned to one room and then get moved to another room in the next few seconds or so. Great. Thank you. Please stay with us after this. We'll have a break, and the next set of presentations will begin at 10.35.
はい。The dilemma we're going around our side, so if, I, if it's too loud, I can mute myself. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Patricia, greetings. Philip. <laughs> um, let's let's give a few minutes for everyone to uh, join, and um, also I want to make sure that the uh, the um, the caption is is ready to go as well. <laughs> Kate, are you uh, are you all set? Yep. I love Philip's Zoom background. Me too. I was just going to say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, can you uh, just do a test run? Uh, oh, okay, you're up. Okay, great. All right. All right. Um, so I want to welcome, I want to make sure we have everybody here. Um, I believe we do. Okay. All right. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, I believe I know everybody here. Um, so what, I don't know, maybe we just do a quick introduction, just your name and your background. We'll make sure everyone knows everybody. Uh, Brianna, you want to go ahead first? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna. I'm a first year resident here in the family medicine department. Um, very interested in disability health and I'm loving the symposium today. Really glad I could attend. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, all right, Patricia, you're next on my screen. I'm Patricia. I'm in the Tottenham Library and I've been active in disability communities since I was a child. Hey, Philip. I am a family physician and obviously deaf with my sign language background and for obvious reasons, I also am interested in disability health. Great. Hey, and last but not least, uh, Bonnie. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Bonnie Deedy. I'm a metadata librarian in Hatcher Library. I'm very interested in language. I have been involved in the disability community for many years. I'm part of the Council for Disability Concerns and Michigan Medicine Disability Council um, of particular interest, hearing impairment and uh, deafness and uh, is of a um, uh, interest to me personally. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to just uh, talk about a couple uh, things that have come up. So one of the challenges with uh, translational research is how we can successfully go from our studies, our projects, our programs, and how to really make them well um, entrenched, implemented in a clinical setting. So I wanted to bring it up because we had several uh, talks today uh, that do have clinical ramifications. Um, so wanted to open up on your thoughts from this morning. Uh, what are things that we should do differently, uh, not only in Michigan medicine, but hopefully across the country as well? Does anybody want to uh, you know, talk about some strategies or thoughts that have come across from this morning? Not so much from this morning, but the question you posed is something I've been working in for over a decade, like mm -hmm. almost 20 years now. And it's engaging patients, engaging patients in the questions, in the study design, having patients on the research teams, patients who are involved and engaged in patient communities because they serve as an information conduit to bring the information out to other patients. And how do you reach primary care doctors to try to get uptake on these things? They listen to their patients. And I've done, so, I have some personal experience with this, where when you want to connect with other doctors who are outside of your immediate sphere, I found the best 
best way is to be out in the broader public. And when they go looking, they find me and then I get pulled in. But by trying to work through channels in the institution, it, it's very hard. It's very slow. There's a lot of, a lot of bumps and barriers. So getting out, being public, I'm um, on the external advisory board for the Mayo Clinic social media network. And what Rebecca was just saying about social media is very important. And the Cochrane collaboration actually has a consumer component where they require patients to be on the research teams. And that's proven very effective for completing the circle on, on getting information out and getting awareness of it and getting that uptake. It's really, it's better than news media. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I'm going to open it up uh, for others uh, to talk about their uh, their thoughts. Yeah, Philip? So, Pat, uh, you go by Pat or Patricia? Patricia. Patricia, sorry. Um, is there a database of patients with disabilities, including what type of disability they have, that we can use and access? for studies, for social media, for um, communication, stuff like that? You... I'm not understanding the question. What do you mean by a database? A database um, Is of there a repository of some place where there's information about that? Like we have, I can look up everybody with diabetes. Let me rephrase that. The uh, interest group of people with diabetes that advocate for diabetes, and we have advocacy groups, but I'm thinking more of in a research capacity. There seems to be more disjointment to clearly in the world around people with disabilities than there are for other diseases. Uh, maybe because there's so many different kinds of disabilities, but there's a lot in common for everybody. So that's why I'm asking that question, because if it is a database or a repository of names with the conditions, we could do what you just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a lot of research teams have been doing is partnering with groups like Smart Patients or 23andMe or um, Patients Like Me. Now, there isn't an overarching community like that specifically for people with disabilities. There's very broad patient communities and then there's very focused support groups. So like for COVID, the long COVID group on Facebook and the Survivors Corps are partnering with researchers on getting patients connected with clinical teams for doing research on that new start. So patient support groups, and the big bucket communities, but we don't have a community that's in the middle. Just want to let everyone know we have um, we have another participant uh, to this group, um, Amber. Um, Amber, are you able to? Maybe we give her a minute to. Oh, there she is. Okay, <laughs> good to see you, Amber. Hi. Sorry, I'm a little. We want to just do a quick introduction um, so that way I, we've already started the discussion. Sorry, um, I just thought it'd be helpful having the cart here. Um, do you want to do a quick introduction? Um, uh, sure. So I'm Amber Kendall Sue. I'm calling in from North Carolina and um, I'm a disability policy postdoc at Northwestern and a health and aging policy fellow for this year. So thank you for having me and I'm so, I'm so excited to hear about the conversations that we have. Great. Uh, Bonnie, I want to make sure we uh, yeah, get to you. I know you raised your hand. Yes. Good patient. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, um, did Shall you? Shall I go ahead now? Shall I go ahead? Um, this is um, emphasizing very heavily the importance of the classification of conditions conditions by names and the location and classification systems 
things are moving around. The more detailed we, we get, the more details we have, the more understanding we have. A moves to B, B moves to X. We need to have better tracking of classification of disease and conditions by names and the locations in the systems. And we call that like a referencing system. Also very important, the language of a condition becomes obsolete or it is further defined, the obsolescence of a name. And guess what? We must not get rid of the old names. We have to have references back of Case in point, I realize this is not a medical condition, but I used to call my refrigerator my ice box. And when my children were in high school, they finally told me, mother, it's okay to call it a refrigerator now. But if you're searching and you only knew of an ice box, even though you have a modern refrigerator, your users, your users can be the medical profession. Medical doctors are very concerned concerned and interested in historical medicine, the terminology used in ancient classical writings, which were categorized under general writings. We have to have a better system to be able to identify and go deep in and pull for today. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the uh, key things, obviously, with the classification, but one of the things that was brought up earlier this morning was communication and uh, the challenge. Uh, we can't really expect primary care providers to be the expert in all of these different conditions. But um, one of the things is how we can improve communication. One of the things that I wanted to just briefly mention, and maybe we can expand on this, is our next upgrade on my chart will include a disability um, you know, list or what we call the accommodations. And that will be on the my, the my story on the right, I mean, on the left hand side. So this is gonna be very exciting and will help not only with the classification, but start to remind providers. Now it doesn't address the communication with teams. So perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more. Anybody want to uh, provide some strategies or even policy? I mean, Amber, Vienna, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so I had talked with Nicholas Reed from John Hopkins, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, and we had actually talked about just the terminology and um, just surrounding disability. And he said that he felt like maybe reframing it as communication, um, not just, oh, you have hearing loss or um, you have blindness, so we need to compensate that one disability, but more so um, like improving communication with the physician overall. And he felt like it helped in some of his prospective studies that he's been conducting at Johns Hopkins with um, improving acceptability of using interventions from patients and also just the willingness to talk about it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that kind of brought, like helped her, but yeah, that's what just came to mind. <laughs> I had a thought too about just um, in terms of communication, not just directly with the physician, but as a team, like as a healthcare team. Um, I recently spoke with Susan Haverkamp at Ohio State, and she um, works with the Alliance on Disability Health, which is a group, a whole group of organizations or, of people with disabilities, without disabilities, from across different medical specialties. And one thing that they really emphasize that that hasn't been taught well. To, to medical students and to residents is this team-based care. This, and this is something that is hard to teach. It's hard to, to teach in a, in a lecture-based setting maybe how, how important it is to, to work with social workers and to work with other specialists and to, to close the loop on, on and not let things fall through the cracks. So I think the MyChart update is, is one way to kind of close the loop and keep us all on the same page, other specialists and things, but I, I and I don't have a solution, but I know that this is a problem. This, this, um, you know, people with disabilities, they, they need their care to be better coordinated um, across the board. And so how do we teach that to medical students and to residents? I think that happens in, in clinic, in seeing other physicians doing that and in, in coordinating care. Um, 
I don't know that I have a great solution, but I do agree with you, Mike, that this is a, a problem, this, this team-based communication. I think this is like a quality improvement project for sure. It's an area where things fall through the cracks. Um, and so that's something that I hope to, to do a little bit more research on and focus on. Thank you. Other thoughts? So um, in our depth health clinic, um, one of the key players is not really us as the doctors, but um, our uh, team members that work closely with us. So uh, we are fortunate to have uh, Leslie Purse, who's a social worker and um, really is um, a key facilitator in just communicating, trying to figure out, address a lot of the issues that are often not well addressed at a clinical setting. Um, and even like for me personally, I'm always learning something new, even though it relates to deaf, uh, hard of hearing issues, uh, because sometimes even working as a doctor, I don't know the everyday struggles on somebody with different backgrounds. Um, so the, the team players are often very hopeful in connecting other teams, especially if they have other types of um, you know, disability-based conditions or comorbidities as well. Um, so that's, that's something that I have found to be extremely helpful for me. Um, for example, even working with the developmental and behavioral pediatrics, um, you know, certainly how to, how to work closely together. Um, we do a fair amount of messaging, but it does require additional effort on the providers. So trying to figure out what is a universal design practice uh, that helps everybody, but really mitigates some of the barriers and gaps that we see with this group. Uh, but those are just some things that I have noticed to be hopeful, um, but certainly more to be done. Other thoughts? One of the things that I'm thinking of is how with the current emphasis on anti-racism, there's a lot of workshops going on about cross-cultural communication. And there's a lot of things I've been learning from that that seem to port over to other communities about how to not make assumptions, how to engage the people you're communicating with in kind of active listening processes, um, not making assumptions about understanding or their understanding or your understanding. Um, so I'm thinking there's probably ways to engage some of the diversity work from other communities in the work that we're trying to do in one-to-one -one communications and clinics and in teams. Thank you, Sorry. I actually, um, that's a good point, Patricia. I was thinking about your comment about anti-racism. And this morning, when they talked about people with disabilities are more likely to have Alzheimer's. I'm wondering why, I mean, we don't know, but that could be in part because of a similar anti-discrimination of some kind, people with disabilities get less of symptoms. So I like the idea of thinking beyond just our disability group and learning from other programs. One of the other thing um, that I also struggle, and I wanted to see if the group had good suggestions. So we heard uh, from our first presenter, um, Donna talked about making sure that the technology assistive devices are matched appropriately. And, um, you know, again, that's a, that's a huge struggle for many of us, like not only uh, how can we counsel our patients, uh, but patients are also overwhelmed. I mean, uh, technology is rapidly uh, changing, um, and also the cost of some of these things can be pretty, uh, pretty substantial. So people are afraid to even experiment or try. Um, so anybody have any good or like best practices uh, how to get around that? I know we heard today with the low vision group, but this can be applied across the board. Um, you know, regardless of the uh, the background. Well, we have a one minute warning. Sorry, let's do real quick. <laughs> Any uh, best practices here? 
I really liked what the first speaker said about listening to what the patients said they wanted and how they worked and how their life works. Being open to being surprised by it. Yeah, so being humble, sometimes they're the experts. Uh, and, you know, it certainly depends on their background. Uh, they could be the experts, but some may not have the benefit of uh, being exposed to these different tools, uh, whether they, you know, they come from a lower back, uh, SES background, may struggle with online stuff, uh, support systems at some point, maybe. All right, 10 seconds for last minute comments. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. We're going to be switching back. If you could just click. Determining the effect, efficacy of a novel employment program for teen people. And so uh, please take this time to get up, to move about, to any, take care of biological needs, and we will all be back together at 1035.
Okay. Thank you and welcome back. Um, we are very excited by the number of folks that we have here um, and by the first uh, converse, uh, pre presentations and conversations. Once again, if you are just joining us, uh, please be aware that what we're doing currently is we're asking the folks who are not speaking to mute both their audio and their video to allow more focus on the specific speakers. We do have closed captioning. We apologize that there were some technical issues earlier, but I believe that they have now been resolved. Um, we will let you know or try and work with you uh, if that happens again. Um, and let me, uh, the, um, and finally, with the presenters themselves, they are being asked to give a 10 minute tell style talk. Uh, when possible, we give them about two minutes to answer questions, um, but we do mute and move on to the next individual after that time. With that, we will start with our next presenter, uh, Kylie Adams from the medical school, who will be talking about Teens on Trails, determining the efficacy of a novel employment program for teens with disabilities. Hi everyone, my name is Kylie Adams and as was said, I'm a second year medical student here at the University of Michigan. Um, and going along with the theme of some tech issues, um, and it wouldn't be a true conference if at least one of the speakers didn't have a solid tech failure. Um, my PowerPoint is currently inaccessible to me for reasons um, outside of my current tech knowledge, but I am comfortable just narrating for now and getting those slides to Dr. McKee so that they can be sent out to all of us that would benefit from a visual. Um, so today we will be talking a little bit about a novel disability employment program in Alaska, some research on the efficacy of that program and how that program can have implications for those of us, which um, I'm assuming of us not working in Alaska. Um, I like to start any conversation about disability and disability programming in Alaska by acknowledging that Alaska was not a state until 1959. And that might seem really tangential at first. Um, but at that time, having a developmental disability or a serious mental health condition made you under federal law an insane person at large. And thousands of people were removed from their communities and shipped to a facility in Oregon for treatment. Um, the resulting lawsuits from these actions created what is known as the Alaskan Mental Health Trust, or simply the trust, um, in order to pay for the local comprehensive and integrated health programming mandated under the Congressional Act, which created this trust. Um, the state was able to select a million acres of land that would be managed to generate the income needed for services. Um, so all that's to say that basically the trust works similarly to a private foundation um, with the goal to promote long term systematic change to trust beneficiaries. Since independent living centers um, serve individuals who are considered trust beneficiaries, um, mostly folks with developmental disabilities, um, TBIs um, and mental illness, many receive money to provide novel services geared at that systems level change. Um, for these communities. Um, what I'll be presenting on today is one of those novel programs um, imagined by a collaboration between um, what's known as SAIL or the Southeast Alaska Independent Living Center and a local youth center called the Zach Gordon Youth Center. The Youth Employment in the Parks program, lovingly known as YEP or the YEP program, is this program. Um, it was founded in Juneau, Alaska and it engages local youth with disabilities um, that age ranges between 16 and 19 years old um, in a summer job experience doing just like what it sounds like trail and park maintenance. The program ultimately um, seeks to tackle socioeconomic disempowerment for individuals with disabilities. Um, as many of us are aware, unemployment rates for people with disabilities are way higher than for those without. Um, I believe the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimated um, a threefold um, higher unemployment rate for people with disabilities. 
um, in 2019. The lack of employment and the associated socioeconomic disempowerment is um, a serious barrier to improving the quality of life for many individuals with disabilities. Um, so the YEP program, program is, um, in short, is Teens on Trails. Um, it's a work crew of individuals with wide ranging disabilities who work on repairing and enhancing community spaces um, while simultaneously working environment to learn and practice um, both their own soft and hard job skills uh, that they'll need to attain future employment. Um, one day a week is protected time away from the trails spent doing career exploration and skill acquisition activities guided by the program staff um, and peer mentors who are employed by the city specifically for their mentorship in that one day spent away from the trails. Um, and this programming can range from there's a kayaking trip focused on team building and communication, um, as well as presentations from local schools and other employers. Um, the remaining four days are spent with um, wheelbarrows and weed whackers and shovels um, doing trail maintenance. The program also emphasizes um, long term community integration for the teens. Um, one of the programs we're most proud of in the southeast is emphasizes local history and culture. Um, Juneau, Alaska is on Clinkett and Haida land, um, and there is a native, um, we call her the culture bearer, um, and she greets the teens on the land they're working. Um, there's stories both about the land and the people who um, were its original caretakers. Um, we get really positive feedback from the teens that that's something they love about the program. Um, and while the program is only in its fifth year, the Juno community is already seeing a lot of just anecdotal positive benefits of the program, um, as well as some program replication throughout Alaska. Many teens who have completed the program um, and graduated high school are now employed in the community, seeking further job training and higher education. Um, before completing this research, I had lived and worked in Juneau um, and was Southeast Alaska Independent Living or SAIL before. Um, at the time, I was serving as a program coordinator for an adaptive recreation program, doing skiing, biking, hiking stuff. Um, but I was also able to serve as staff um, several years back on some YEP events um, prior to doing this research. Um, SAIL got to take me back on this summer um, with the goal of providing some more robust data surrounding the efficacy of this program. Um, so onto the research, the fun stuff. Um, we administered a five level Likert based survey throughout the program um, to look for participant identified growth in numerous categories. Um, the survey was administered three times beginning, middle and end of the six week program to the full cohort of 12 teenagers. And a t-test was performed to compare the mean scores of the survey responses. The survey questions attempted to capture the youth's opinions of their job skills, um, future career confidence, sense of contributing positively to the community, um, and a statistically significant at P equals 0.05 level um, increase was seen in participant agreement to the statements, I have all the skills I need to be a good employee, I am going to have a full-time job in the future. Um, and both of those were seen over the six-week um, six program. Also, at the end of the program, all 12 participants unanimously agreed or strongly agreed, or sorry, they unanimously either agreed or strongly agreed um, with the statements, staff want me to succeed at work. I feel safe in my current work environment. I have a new friend or mentor because of YEP. Being a part of a team is important to being a good employee. And the one that I think a lot of people that work the program are most proud of, um, I contribute positively to the Juno community. Um, we asked participants to identify skills gained, and they most identified work ethic, ability to follow directions, and being supportive coworkers as their most acquired skills. The program did not appreciably alter participants post high school plans, um, both before and after the YEP program, five individuals indicated hoping to attend college, two indicated a preference for a trade school. Um, while at week zero, three individuals stated that they were hoping to seek immediate employment, um, and two individuals said that they didn't know plans, those numbers got switched at the end with um, three individuals saying they weren't sure 
certain and two seeking immediate employment. Um, this analysis suggests that the YEP program helps youth with disabilities gain um, both the job skills and relationships, which may positively impact their future ability to gain employment without necessarily altering their planned career pursuits. Future research hopes to um, follow participants longitudinally into the workforce in the years to come. I believe that there is potential for this type of place-based participant-centered programming to be replicated by other, whether that's independent living centers or um, disability centers in general um, across the country in what we call the lower 48. Um, and in those spaces where there already are programming, um, room for more collaboration and um, both on programming and education materials. Um, together, hopefully these programs can contribute to changing unemployment gaps for individuals with disabilities, um, even if that's just one positive youth employment opportunity at a time. And that is all I have for now. I'm going to check the chat. Um, and yeah, welcome any and all questions or comments. Absolutely. I see one about um, how I got connected with the program. Um, and how do they engage teens with physical disabilities? Great questions. Um, I think I briefly commented on how I got connected to the program. Um, I lived and worked in Juneau and so was familiar with SAIL and the YEP program. Um, how do they engage teens with physical disabilities? Um, there was a lot of talk around what to set the physical um, requirements of the program at. The first year we did the program, um, there was a requirement to be able to carry 35 pounds um, for like weed whackers and things up trailheads. Um, and once we had a participant curious in participating who wouldn't be able to meet that requirement, um, we changed the requirement and made it so that that person was able to um, do more city park work um, that were already accessible locations, as well as having one of the YEP crews work on making another um, location that they were working on accessible to that crew member to be able to work. So great. We look forward to learning more or for people being able to reach out to you. Very exciting program. And thank you for sharing your research on it. Thank You're you. right. Employment is a very much a critical area for reducing disparities under for individuals with disabilities. Our next presenter is Alec Bernard um, from the medical school. He will be talking about the impact of the COVID pandemic on individuals with disabilities and particularly individuals with sensory disabilities as um, we have the presentation after that talking about individuals with physical disabilities. So uh, Alec, we will make sure that you have the access you need and can present. Yes, uh, I think you guys should be able to hear me now. Um, and I think you should see my screen also. Yes, we do. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I am going to be chatting with all of you here today about the um, impact of the current COVID, uh, uh, the impact of the current COVID-19 um, Pan the impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic on people who have um, who have primarily sensory impairments. And so um, I want to briefly start by uh, by going over a very brief overview of kind of how things were before all of this pandemic started. And even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, people who had, um, people who had uh, disabilities were at a greater risk for um, accessing healthcare challenges, uh, I, ADLs, um, and maintaining financial well-being compared to those without any disabilities. And some examples of this are that the um, unemployment rate among uh, 
visually impaired or blind adults in the US was more than fourfold higher than in the general population. And uh, people who have hearing impairments were uh, also 50% less likely to be participating in the, in the um, workforce. And then the impact of the current COVID-19 pan, uh, pan uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic has not been well described and it is not known whether the pandemic is currently disproportionately creating challenges. Um, and the stay at home and other pandemic uh, mitigation measures are also likely to um, worsen any psychological uh, or, or financial or other day-to-day -day challenges for the entire population. And so we hypothesize that the COVID-19 pandemic um, would actually disproportionately worsen all of these day-to-day -day challenges for people who have disabilities compared to the overall population. So what we did um, was we have developed a, a novel survey um, to try to see what the real, um, what the real uh, what the real burden has been. Um, and our survey pr uh, primarily looks at the items on the list presented here. Um, and our 32 items item survey was developed by, um, by a large consensus um, of, uh, of people from the fields of survey, um, survey research, P, M and R, family med, ophthalmology and industrial and operations engineering. We also published our survey to be able to have it be available to other groups who may want to use it in their own contexts. Um, and it is available here for anyone who would be interested in also downloading it. Um, to very briefly go over more of what our survey has, um, it has both a lot of new items um, and then it also has many items that are that are pulled from other existing surveys and so we used two from the um, SF 36 and then we also pulled out of the PHQ2 to assess overall and then also psychological health. And then we also pulled um, items from the um, other surveys here to look at measures of social isolation and other difficulties obtaining food or accessing um, uh, healthcare. Um, we we ended up partially pulling from these other surveys because it will make it easier to uh, to harmonize um, our survey data with these um, with these other larger studies to be able to easily to easily compare between population groups. And so, what did we actually do with this? Um, we ended up primarily recruiting patients from the source um, and from another data direct poll of, uh, of hearing participants. And then we, um, we ended up matching participants um, 
from a list uh, who were seen for their annual healthy eye um, exam visit. And so we emailed out our survey first and then waited five days and, uh, and then sent an email reminder. And then two days after that, we ended up calling everybody who did not answer the survey via email. So what did we find? Overall, we had about um, half and half male to uh, female respondents. In terms of our age range, most of our participants were in the 50 years old to 80 age range. And then here we, we have them actually split up by each of our categories. Um, and the hearing impaired uh, had a higher proportion of people in the 50 to 80 age range compared to our sight um, people. And then here, this is a um, measure of the uh, of the sort of overall illness level um, of our various patients. And it has items in it like heart disease, diabetes, strokes, and it is a pretty good predictor of the overall 10-year mortality rate. Um, and we found that it was basically similar over all of our groups. So what did we find from our other survey? Um, so the PHQ2 is a very strong pre is a very strong predictor of a major depression um, of a major depressive state. And what we found is that the visually impaired patients did score significantly higher um, compared to either of the other two groups on both question one and on the PH2 question two. And then this was uh, a way for us to see overall how much their lives ended up being disrupted. And we, we found that there were no major differences across any of, any of, our, um, any of our categories. We also found that there were no um, that there were no actual differences in uh, if they had any difficulty obtaining food, obtaining medicines that they needed, or accessing medical care. They were um, they were all pretty much even. Um, and so overall, I think we ended up being slightly surprised that we did not find larger noticeable differences. And I, uh, we are planning to do um, additional analyses to better understand how each of these may vary by age or sex or level of, um, of in, in impairment um, and to also see if there are any factors that may moderate um, uh, these, these other changes. Um, we also <clears throat> ended up having <clears throat> from the Ann Arbor area. Um, and over 90% of our participants were, um, were white. Uh, and then there also may have been a, um, a, an overtime difference in how we ended up ha having things. Thank and you I think very I'm, much.
Um, Alec, we very much appreciate your presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have time right now for questions, um, but I imagine that there may be some overlap in the questions that come up uh, with Lisa Reaver's presentation. At this point, I am delighted to introduce uh, Lisa Reaver from the F Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She will be talking on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on adults with long-term physical All right, is my screen shared? Um, not yet. Um, we do see your image there. So. That's not useful then, is it? Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Now we see a screen and you just gotta go, there you go. There we go, we are good. So again, um, my name is Lisa Reber and I am Dr. Michelle Mead's postdoctoral research fellow. So in early April, as the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic was becoming clear, Dr. Mead and I wanted to know what the uh, experiences of people with physical disabilities was with the pandemic. And we were targeting those who typically tend to be forgotten in disability research, low-income individuals from racially and ethnically marginalized groups. Over approximately six weeks, April through mid-May, I interviewed 16 individuals. We wanted to know their thoughts, their concerns, um, their experiences with the pandemic, and especially too about the need to socially distance and to isolate and how that impacted their day-to-day -day lives. What we learned was that some of the participants didn't think their uh, situation or experiences much differed from those without disabilities. Well, you know, like most people, we're bored to death. Nothing to do but watch TV. Others, however, were quite clear about the difference. As Laura said, for people that felt isolated before, it's almost like a deeper dive into isolation. I think it can be a bit difficult for people without disabilities to appreciate how the pandemic impacted uh, people with disabilities differently. People without disabilities are also saying, I'm vulnerable to, terrified to go out, sick of being alone, unable to see my doctor. So what does a deeper dive look like? for folks with physical disabilities. What does a deeper dive feel like? In the remainder of this talk, I'm going to zoom in on one of the, uh, or a couple of the themes and focus on issues also of capacity and recognition and the role that they play. As one informant said, who works with people with disability, they're very frustrated. For them, it's just one more thing, it's just one more layer. And Laura, she said, it's worse because we're still unseen. We still feel we're not part of the collective human experience. And as a result, they're more invisible, further reinforcing the idea that they're not part of the collective human experience. So what are the ramifications of that deeper dive? What's the impact on being invisible. Travell said he was not receiving the physical therapy he needed and that not receiving it was a burden on his health. Laura pointed out that when people are unable to receive therapies and treatments, they're not just going to have setbacks, but their health could potentially be irrevocably impacted. So for people with disability, a deeper dive means being invisible and because I am invisible, my health is negatively impacted. And that impact can be permanent. That deeper dive into isolation, that deeper dive into invisibility motivates some people to recognize their vulnerability and to actively reduce it and others to do nothing. Perhaps the risk was not understood or perhaps it's the failure, consciously or unconsciously, to recognize that risk 
and one's seeming inability to change the circumstances. Two of our participants from the study, Steve and Grady, are examples of this. Steve said, I have a spinal cord injury. I'm paralyzed from the neck down. That's pretty compromised. I mean, just being around the flu and things like that. I'm like, whoa, like if people are sick, man, stay away. Steve recognized or acknowledged his needs and how certain needs put him at a greater risk. Others though, don't recognize or can't recognize such risks. Grady said, my caregivers, they wash their hands, they, every 10 seconds, they're constantly spreading things down, they're, they're constantly, you know, they're just, they're, just, they're just on it, they're just constantly cleaning. So Grady said he wasn't really worried about his multiple caregivers coming and going. Why did Steve see their caregivers, and they both required 24-hour caregive seven days a week. So why did Steve see them as a risk and Grady did not? I believe it's driven by what they see as their capacity to change their circumstances. And this perception of whether or not they have that capacity determines whether they choose to recognize risk or choose, knowingly or unknowingly, to not see it or diminish it. Steve believed he had the capacity. The whole idea is eliminating risk, social distancing, minimizing caregivers from five or six that are in and out of the house down to one. Steve knew that to minimize his risk, he needed to minimize his exposure to caregivers. Steve said, I went to one of the senators that I know and I said, hey, like this is what's going on. So they had this understanding of what my services are like, what he needed to stay safe. And it was through Steve's persistence that he was able to arrange it. That's how one caregiver is able to take care of me. Steve receives support from both Medicaid and Medicare. They provide the caregiver support, but Steve takes care of his own hiring of caregivers. A nonprofit organization acts as fiduciary and administers the funds. There are rules regulating how the funds can be used and living in the home of one of his caregivers and having that person be paid and covered for all the hours is not part of the rules. But Steve was able to achieve that. I think Steve was able to recognize the risk because he believed he had the capacity to alter his circumstances. Grady, in contrast, may have not given voice to the risk because he didn't know the risk or he did not have the capacity to alter his need to have five or six caregivers entering his home throughout the week. Asked if his caregivers wore masks, Grady said, no, they know I don't go anywhere. After one of his caregivers caught the coronavirus, she was out for two weeks um, before, uh, before she was able to return. Afterwards, Grady was told uh, to let the company that provides the caregivers know if he heard of them uh, coughing badly. Grady said he was afraid by the pandemic, but he either didn't understand the risk or he rationalized away those thoughts that didn't align with his circumstances and which he believed he had no control over. Grady said, no, multiple caregivers are not something that I worry about. Grady was unable, uh, believed he was unable uh, to alter his circumstances. He had to accept them. Steve, on the other hand, believed he had the capacity to bring about change. This allowed him to recognize and acknowledge risk, and as he put it, to have one less thing to worry about and to make that deeper dive a little bit easier to manage. Thank you. The end. Thank you, um, Lisa, for your very interesting presentation. Um, can you give a little context about um, what was going on when you started this, about the study itself? Right, it's part of the broader study. Um, that um, I'm doing with Michelle and the RTC project. Um, and it involves interviewing uh, 
Well, it started out by uh, focusing on focus groups with 30 individuals in Flint and 30 individuals in Detroit with physical disabilities um, severe enough uh, to generally require a walker or a, a, a wheelchair with the idea that we wanted people who were one um, um, needed to rely on uh, resources and benefits um, and individuals who were engaged uh, with their community and um, generally kind of have so, a positive outlook on life. So the more important part, I guess, is that there was an existing study that you just adapted when all this came up. Yes, it was what, already in place. Right. What do you think were some of the key differences between the capacity of Grady and Steve? Why the difference? Um, I think there's a po lot of possibilities right there. Um, one, one is that they both come from very uh, low income backgrounds, right? So that, that, that was being pretty even. Difference, Steve is white, Grady's black. Um, and Steve talked very much about basically being groomed by one of the nonprofit organizations um, to, to be an advocate and to um, be an activist, right? And so he, he was taught that he has power and that he can um, engage and he can, he can make changes. And so, and the question is, did he get that opportunity because he was white? I don't know. Um, um, but, you know, being taught how to, is, is, I think, was a really important part of it. Wonderful. Thank you. We're uh, powerful presentation. We'll now move on to Philippa Clark from the Institute for Social Research. She will be talking on the role of the built environment for participation among adults aging with physical disabilities. Philippa. Hi, everybody. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. All right. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Philippa Clark. I am a faculty member at the Institute for Social Research and also the School of Public Health. I'm a gerontologist and an epidemiologist by training, um, but my work really focuses on adults aging with disabilities. And I specifically um, look at the role of the environment. So I'm going to talk to you today at a very high level overview of the kind of work that I do and why I do it. Um, I've been doing research on the environment for probably over two decades. First, um, as a graduate student at the University of Toronto, and then as a postdoc at Duke University, and then coming to the University of Michigan as a faculty member in 2005. And um, the work that I do is motivated by this woman. This is my mother, Aileen Clark. And my mother uh, grew up in England during the Second World War. She lived in the northern part of England on the coast. She um, experienced persistent bombing. Uh, she was experienced rationing. She wore a gas mask to school every day. Um, beaches were mined, even though my family has a long history of sailing and she loved sailing. But despite all these adversities, she was very resilient and she went on to medical school and was one of the first women to go to medical school in her community. And she went to the Royal Free Hospital uh, to train to be a medical uh, doctor in London, England. Shortly after she graduated, she and my father came to Canada on their honeymoon and they never left. So I was born in Toronto and then she provided me with experience that I'll never forget. And when she was in her early 40s, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And as I watched her becoming more and more disabled as she aged, I also noticed that she became more and more resilient and she found ways to overcome her declines in physical function to continue to participate and be an active member in society. So one of the things I began to realize, one of the things that was actually influencing her ability to engage in society was the environment. And I became acutely aware of the role of the built environment when I left Toronto, which was characterized by wide streets, wide sidewalks, curb cuts, an accessible public transit system that had transit stops that were sheltered with benches to rest upon. 
and I moved to North Carolina to Duke University to do my postdoc. And I encountered environments that looked like this. And I began to think, what would my mother do if she had to walk down the street, if she had to go down the street even in her wheelchair? There's no sidewalks. There's no protection from oncoming cars. And she, because she can't drive, she needs to take public transit. And heading to the bus stop, which was just down the street, it would look like this. There's no place to rest. There's no shelter from the sun. And so I began to realize that disability is in fact something that is not an inherent characteristic of a person, but in fact, it is socially created and is in fact a gap between a person's capabilities and the demands that are created by the way we create our physical and social environments. So I think the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health can be a really useful framework for thinking about how we understand disability and what we consider disability to be. So in the, in the context of my mother, and we're thinking about someone with multiple sclerosis, there's a health condition that leads to impairments in body functions in terms of her weak legs or her inability to move her legs. That can lead to limitations in activities, which are the um, ability to walk, outside, and that can limit her participation in society, her ability to go sailing and engage with friends. But these pathways are not deterministic, they're not predetermined. And in fact, they can be modified by the environmental factors and the social factors that are in the communities that we live in. So the environmental factors that are described in the ICF include products and technology, such as wheelchairs and scooters that allowed her to continue to engage and walk around and participate, even though she had limitations in her leg function. Attitudes and stereotypes, so the lack of stereotypes, positive attitudes that she had allowed her to overcome those impairments. Accessible transportation was a big factor in enabling her to be participating in society. And also the way that we have structured and created our natural and human made environments. So my work does focus on the built environment, which is defined as all buildings, spaces and products that are created or modified by people. It actually includes our indoor environment, but also the outdoor environment. Um, and it really impacts all of our health and quality and life of life. When we're thinking about trying to measure these features, it's often troublesome or challenging to actually kind of find a way to empirically document the environments that people are living in. Most of my work that I do has looked at and sort of used secondary data sources like the census data or looking even at um, business density to come up with density of recreation facilities or parks around people's neighborhoods. But the small grain features of the environment that are relevant for people like my mother who struggled with multiple sclerosis are not actually readily available on existing secondary data sources. And so we turn to using Google Street View as a way to actually document and characterize the built environment in which people are living with disability. So for example, this is a, a Google Street View image in Detroit. It was taken a while back for a study that we did. We were doing a study of about 1,200 vulnerable low-income older adults in Detroit who were qualified for federal or state funded home and community based services. Um, they were eligible for a nursing home, but they had taken Medicaid waiver program uh, to continue to receive home in their communities. But what were those communities like and how was that affecting their outcomes. So we used Google Street View to basically virtually walk around the block where these people were living and document features of the environment that are related to health and functioning. We documented whether there were sidewalks in place on both sides of the street, whether the sidewalks were continuous in terms of the fact that they weren't unbroken. So in this image, you can see that the sidewalk becomes, it gradually begins to disappear beside this gray house and is full of obstacles in terms of grass and uneven pavement. We also documented whether the sidewalks were free from obstructions, from tree roots, parking meters and poles, and whether they were wide enough to allow two people to pass comfortably which is a rough indication of whether someone can pass on a wheelchair. 
We also documented whether there were curb cuts at the crossings. And we found that for these people in living in Detroit, that almost 20% actually never left their homes in the 15 months that we followed them. But amongst those who um, were living in more accessible neighborhoods, they were in fact 15% more likely to go out than those living in less accessible neighborhoods. So even just thinking about simple things like whether there's a sidewalk that's accessible outside someone's front door, whether there is a bus stop down the street, are actually key things that can influence simple things like being able to go outside and engage in society. So the Americans with Disability Act celebrates its 30th year, and it's one of the most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation. It guarantees that people with disabilities will have the same opportunities to access um, health care, rehabilitation, education, employment. One of the things that actually gets in the way of accessing all of those resources and engaging in society are curbs. And in the qualitative work that we're doing right now with people aging with spinal cord injury, they talk about the simple thing of a curb that can prevent them from crossing the street and getting to where they need to go. The Americans with Disability Act mandated that curb cuts be put in at all intersections, but it can be completely redundant if there is actually no sidewalk to connect it and to be used. What about the weather? All the Google Street View images that you can look at are done in the summer, but the weather is a key factor preventing access and movement for people who have limitations in mobility getting out in the, some of the weather that we experience here in Michigan on a regular basis. So in summary, my view and my belief in what disability is that it's a, an expression of a physical or mental limitation in a social context. And if we're to understand how disability is created and constructed, we must consider the context in which people are living. So to conclude, I want to mention that two years before my mother's death, she was taking her grandson on a walk to the park and she was in her scooter and she navigated some uneven pavement and her scooter tipped over and she broke her hip. She lived for two more years, even though a broken hip was the cause of death on her death certificate, but she still managed in that time period to find ways to do things that matter to her, such as sailing. Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. Um, wonderful presentation and overview of what you do and why. Um, does anyone have any specific questions or comments for Philippa? So Mike um, has a question here. Is there an environmental scoring system that factors items such as weather? It's a good point. So the, I, the scoring system that I used in my previous work did not include weather because we couldn't see any images of weather related factors on Google Street View. But we, um, we've used other measures more specifically asking about weather in different national surveys, really trying to make this to be a question that people will think about and incorporate when they're thinking about participation and barriers. And I guess just as a plug, can you talk a little bit about, uh, for maybe a minute, the, the database um, system that you created and what you hope with it? For, yes, and for the two, 20 years I've been doing neighborhood research, I've been struck by the redundancy in which neighborhood data are created but never shared. So uh, I created the National Neighborhood Data Archive, which is hosted through ICPSR at the University of Michigan which makes publicly available a host of neighborhood environment for the entire United States, at multiple levels of spatial scale from the census tract zip code county that people can draw upon to promote and integrate looking at environmental factors as are related to disability and different health outcomes. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your important work. We're delighted now to have a talk by Kayla Helm from Family Medicine and the M Disability Program. She will be talking about understanding the barriers of facilitators for audiology follow-up, secondary analysis of early auditory referral in primary care.
Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Kayla Helm. I'm a recent UPenn graduate, and today I'll be presenting the research I conducted with M Disability as a summer intern. And M Disability is one of the family medicine programs that are part of the University of Michigan Medical School. Understanding the barriers and facilitators for audiology follow up. This is a secondary analysis of early auditory referral in primary care or ear PC. So I want you to imagine that you are a patient. You go to see your primary care provider and you have a lot of health concerns that you wanna discuss. And in that conversation, the doctor asks you a single question. Do you have difficulty with your hearing? This one question helps drive the conversation in a positive way. You're able to talk about the challenges you've had with your hearing and receive an audiology referral. By giving you this single question hearing screening, you can now choose to continue seeking care through audiology. This was the experience of many of the patients that were part of the ear PC feasibility study. It was conducted in which clinicians received a brief educational program, an electronic clinical prompt to screen for hearing loss during applicable patient visits. Patients separately did HHIs or the hearing handicap inventory and they wanted to see if the prompt would increase the audiology referrals for at-risk patients. So to give you some context about hearing loss in the US, it affects 16% of the adult population. It's the second most prevalent disability and third most chronic condition. One of the main risks, one of the many risk factors is increasing age, which is clearly shown by these hearing loss percentages. Despite its high prevalence, hearing loss is clinically underdiagnosed, which means that there's limited health access for many. Only 20 to 22% of those with hearing loss actually obtain and use hearing aids. So that's why having a subjective test, like a single question screening conducted by your doctor, an assessment scale like the hearing handicap inventory, or an objective audiogram or pure tone test is so necessary for early detection. Also, patients with hearing loss also have adverse cognitive, physical, and psychosocial outcomes, really building the case to study the experiences of patients throughout this healthcare util utilization process. So like the scenario I asked you to imagine, we wanted to follow this natural timeline that a patient would experience from the initial hearing loss screening to the eventual treatment. To best understand this experience, our research questions were one, do patients feel comfortable being screened for hearing loss? Two, do patients follow up with referrals? And three, do patients follow audiologist recommendations? So the study population included 348 patients that were all aged over 55 and had a hearing handicap inventory greater than 10, which would indicate probable hearing loss. And the patients were randomly sampled for a three month follow up telephone survey that included a questionnaire with open ended notes. And for data analyses, we use univariative analyses, which is based on the survey responses. So these were very descriptive in nature. And we were really looking at those categorical responses that the participants had to the questions, but there was also an opportunity for open-ended comments, and those comments were qualitatively coded, and the themes were categorized. So they were coded separately by myself and my faculty mentor, Dr. McKee, and then we checked for agreement, and we created a coding dictionary that categorized all of these common themes. So we looked at the first question in two ways patients' perceptions toward hearing loss discussion and their perceptions toward receiving a referral. So patients were asked, do you remember how you felt about this conversation? And most had a positive reaction, but they also had an opportunity to discuss their thoughts further through the open-ended responses. And you can see in this table that some of the common themes have been categorized. And something that I wanna pinpoint is a lot of the patients kind of went into that appointment really ready to talk about hearing loss, whereas others kind of talked about how they were more like the scenario I asked you to imagine where the provider's questions led to this discussion. So this shows how important this positive provider engagement is for 
just feeling comfortable with that initial conversation. So here's an example of one of the quotes. She was extremely impressed that hearing loss was brought up at her last appointment. Her husband has been very understanding of her hearing loss for the past 12 to 13 years, and she was relieved and impressed with the quality of care. So this is also an example of family encouragement and positive provider engagement. So looking at audio, the audiology referrals altogether, 82% of the 348 city population actually received a referral. And patients were also asked, how did you feel about receiving one? And again, patients had an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about their thoughts through those open-ended responses. And one patient said that he brought it up to his doctor because of his wife thinking he had a hearing problem. And he said it was nice to be able to speak to his doctor about it and be referred to audiology. A lot of the patients had a general positive attitude toward receiving referral. And a lot of them felt like the referral really addressed one of their priorities in their life. So the next question, we were looking at, you know, what happens between scheduling an appointment and actually seeing an audiologist? So 75% of the patients self-reported receiving a referral that, re that received a referral made an appointment to see an audiologist. And you can see here in purple uh, is a larger percentage that actually made an appointment and saw an audiologist and in green, those that just haven't seen an audiologist yet. So patients explain why they did not make an audiology appointment. So those, that percentage that the 25% that did not make an appointment were able to kind of explain their thoughts on why they didn't. And again, these are the common themes that were categorized. And for many, they talked about the impact of cost, not having insurance coverage and having competing health, family and time demands. For example, some patients explained that, you know, they cannot afford to see an audiologist, insurance doesn't cover it. Another that they were just dealing with a lot of physical issues that were more important right now, and maybe they would go in the future. And then for our last question, we wanted to see if patients actually seek treatment. So audiologists often recommend a wide, wide, a wide range of treatments like hearing aids, further testing, maybe to return in another year, or that their hearing might not be severe enough to do anything at that moment. But for those that decided not to take on those recommendations, why didn't they? And many talked about the cost of insurance, the cost and lack of insurance coverage. So looking at those that were recommended hearing aids, only 42% actually received them. And one patient said, you know, they would love to have hearing aids, but is simply unable to because purchasing them, um, they can't purchase them because they're not covered by her insurance. So if your doctor would have asked you, do you have difficulty hearing, no matter how you would have answered that question, there seems to be forces outside of a patient's control that are affecting one's access to care. Some patients could not see an audiologist and some of those that did weren't able to afford the recommended treatment. So this leads me to discuss some of the project's main findings. What are the facilitators and barriers for audiology follow-up? So some of the facilitators is positive provider engagement. How is that initial conversation that a patient had with their PCP, but also family encouragement. That's something that came up a lot in reading the different responses that patients provided. Some of the barriers were cost and insurance coverage. A lot of patients wanted to get hearing aids, but they couldn't afford to. And a lot had a lot of other ailments that they were dealing with that were more pressing. So I think this study has a lot of implications for policymakers, providers, health systems, and patients that there needs to be better ways to address these healthcare access issues. Looking at like the whole study, not all the patients that received referrals were able to see audiologists and take on the recommendation. Of the 284 referrals, only 63% saw an audiologist. So what's next? I think it would be really interesting to focus more on the impact of cost and insurance coverage. Medicare and most health insurance plans do not provide coverage for hearing aids. And in 2014, the average cost was between $2,200 and $7,000. And it might be interesting to see how, you know, we have a lot of telemedicine right now because of the pandemic, how teleaudiology can serve to kind of close these gaps, or if there are other more affordable over-the-counter hearing aids that could provide an alternative form of treatment. So I wanna thank all the people from the M-Disability team, as well as those involved in the Disability Health and Wellness Center for the opportunity to speak today. 
And I know we have two minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, I'll love to answer them. And if you don't get a chance to, you could always contact me at my um, UMIS email. Wonderful presentation, Kayla. Um, so is audiology itself usually covered by um, insurance? The referral? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if it's always covered. I think it just depends on on like if it's in network or out of network. I, I'm not definite if it's always covered for patients. Um, um, I know I know some of the patients and their responses talked about how they were referred and then they wanted to make an appointment and then they realized it wasn't covered and they would have to pay out of pocket. So a lot talked about like going to Costco or trying to find out another way to get a hearing aid that was more affordable. So kind of from the patient's responses, I have an idea, but not generally. Okay. And were they able to find audiologists when they were referred? Uh, I think probably a large percent, just looking at the numbers, most of the patients, a lot of the patients who were referred didn't say in their responses that they had trouble finding an audiologist. I think the biggest deterrent for a lot of the patients is, was the cost and insurance coverage. Yeah. And I guess I saw some issues, Medicare only covers diagnostic testing, which does not apply for that. There was some information about audiology covered, but hearing aids not. Um, did you find any uh, differences with regard to gender or race uh, with regard to Oh, that's a really good question. So we didn't really look at, so this was just like a second year looking at the three month follow up. Mm -hmm. So I don't recall if in the initial study when they were looking at if there would be an increase in referrals, the impact of race or gender on that, but it would be interesting to kind of look further into the data to see looking at the actual audiology follow ups, how many of the patients like was there a connection between race and gender? Something that I would like to look at more also is when I was looking at each question, I was only looking at a snapshot and I didn't really follow each um, experience long longitudinally through the data set. So it'd also be interesting to figure out how comfortable the patient was with the initial conversation, how that impacted if they actually went and got the treatment the audiologist recommended. So I was only looking at each step and not really through the set. So that's a really good question. And thank you very much. We're now gonna move on to um, the last of the uh, peer-reviewed presenters. Uh, Julia Robinson Lane from the School of Nursing will be presenting on improving quality of life for older adults and their family caregivers through team science. Well, hello, and I'm glad that you all are able to um, join us. I hope, let me make sure that, uh, thank you guys. Can you see this okay? Yes. Okay. Um, let me see here. There we go. Okay, so as mentioned, I'm um, Sharia Robinson Lane. I'm faculty over in the School of Nursing. And um, I love old people. Um, that's what my life and work has revolved around over the past nearly 20 years, um, both clinically as well as in um, research. I've really spent my time focusing on how to optimize health for older adults and how to facilitate aging in place, which means allowing people to continue to live in their homes for as long as possible and surrounded by the people that they love. Similar to uh, Philippa, my work is uh, very much so guided by my grandmother, um, Lula Brown. She was born in 1921 in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, and was one of 12 children. She had eight children, two husbands, 26 grandchildren, and more than 45 great-grands. 
She survived stomach cancer in her 70s and was able to remain in her home until she was 93 years old. Um, she then transferred to a um, transitional care facility that offered tiered living opportunities. And so there was um, assisted living and more intensive um, care based upon her care needs. Um, where, and she was able to reside in this same space until she was 98 years old. So in thinking about my grandmother over the trajectory of her life and in beginning to really compare her care outcomes to many of the older adults that I was seeing as a nurse in practice and in the community, there was really a large difference in this really uh, resilient, highly active, highly engaged life that she was living that wasn't really, um, held back in any way, if you will, uh, compared to so many other individuals that were much younger and experiencing so many other sorts of complications. Um, my grandmother did, when she died, her primary cause of death was Alzheimer's disease. And prior to moving to the um, facility that she went to, we had uh, family members that moved into her home uh, for uh, about a year or two to uh, help to coordinate care, make sure that it was a safe environment and to allow her to extend the time that she was staying in that space before it began to be uh, less safe for her uh, to be there. And so as I, again, thought about what were some of the differences in care that was available to her and what led to her both longevity and her excellent um, health, I really started to think more so about what were the things that made it really challenging for other individuals. And this is where we really get to the meat of a lot of the work that I do, which focuses on health disparities, which are these preventable differences in disease burden, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health. Keyword meaning preventable. And so we have issues like, you know, with not only the diagnoses that people get, but there's very large differences um, across race and ethnicity and just getting a diagnosis. For um, Black older adults, we know that many people um, aren't diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease um, sometimes at all or in the very late stages um, where there's um, a lot less mediation um, that can be done. There's a lot of ageism in place where people um, sort of expect that as you get old, that disability is simply a part of um, aging rather than connecting it with uh, chronic disease and the effects of chronic disease. There's challenges in access to care, as we've heard in some of our uh, prior presentations that will vary by neighborhood, which we know is closely tied to both socioeconomic status as well as social policies around um, where individuals are allowed to live based on race and ethnicity. And so one of the things that um, we've really been thoughtful about um, as it relates to health disparities that often is missing from the conversation is what is the role of institutionalized racism as well as the policies um, and cultural practices that support maintaining these barriers that create um, barriers in education and all of these various things that lead to um, health disparities, which again are pre uh, uh, preventable. And so as I think about my uh, research and how that has been guided, the primary question that I've thought about is what are the factors that contribute to adaptation for the adults that we see that are resilient, the ones like my grandmother that continue to have um, higher health outcomes that have the most optimized uh, health. And so when I think about what it means to um, age in place, Generally, individuals who are aging in place are focused on these five main um, areas in order to do that successfully. They're using family caregivers who oftentimes, as I describe them, are voluntold um, into the work that they're doing. They don't necessarily volunteer or get the opportunity to um, even learn about what they're doing. They just sort of get thrust into it out of necessity. 
Um, there's the increased use of paid caregivers. Um, so individuals are, um, if they're able to and can afford it, um, or if their insurance covers it, will supplement the care that family is providing with some individuals who are more professionally trained. Um, sometimes that brings a whole set of no, uh, different barriers with concerns about safety um, um, and issues with um, uh, financial abuse and all sorts of other problems that can come with even inviting um, professionals, but um, strangers nevertheless into uh, the home. And how do we prepare individuals to most effectively use uh, paid caregivers? There's environmental adaptions that have to take place as we've also discussed here in um, over the last, you know, with this last section here, not only within the community about how people are able to get out into the community to be able to do things like exercise or just go outside, but what is the physical environment of the actual home? And so what does it look like um, in the space, the physical space that the individual lives in, and then how is their health optimized or not optimized based on what is available and accessible um, to them. Then we have personal adaptations, which are the ways in which individuals make particular um, changes individually to um, adapt to their um, increasing disability, um, again, related to disease. And then finally, what support services are available locally in the community. And so much of my research has focused in two primary areas on that list, which are the personal adaptations and family uh, caregiving. The uh, first area with personal adaptations, I've looked a lot at chronic pain and found that uh, chronic pain is the most common uh, form of um, common cause of disability uh, internationally you know, uh, primarily related to uh, back pain, but all sorts of pain uh, prevent people from being able to not only have optimized health, but it's physically debilitating and it affects really every single aspect of the person from their uh, social to emotional to spiritual um, needs and um, ability to thrive in every single one of those areas. And so some of the things that we know are problematic um, and necessary is the need to improve effective pain management, encouraging uh, mobility despite pain, and then helping people to prepare for uh, care transitions um, when increase in disability doesn't allow them to be able to remain in their primary environment. And so um, some of the work that I've done um, related to um, chronic pain is looking particularly at black older adults that were community living to really understand what are some of the factors that help them to personally um, age in place and to manage pain that um, is generally rated from moderate to severe. And um, the particular adaptive coping strategies that um, the adults that were part of this uh, study indicated were strategies like remaining positive, um, maintaining an increased activity level, continuing to be engaged in the community despite um, whatever was taking place with them, um, high religiosity, um, including both prayer and meditation, as well as maintaining positive support systems. In this other area of family caregiving, we know that there's over 34 million family caregivers of persons over the age of 50, and specifically individuals who are providing care for persons with disabilities um, related to cognitive um, impairment um, experience the worst health outcomes, because that's a very stressful role to be in for these um, caregivers where there aren't often a lot of supports um, for them. Um, and so one of the things that we know that we need to do on the provider end is we really have to have a better understanding of what the support needs are of these caregivers, particularly diverse caregivers, as well as our um, intergenerational caregivers, because sometimes we really don't think about um, when you, uh, for example, send your children over to your parents' home that um, has some sort of impairment to provide um, some assistance, whether it's helping to prepare a meal or, say, just keeping an eye on grandma, those are all caregiving responsibilities. And so how are we better preparing families and preparing, for example, those grandchildren about what sorts of things to expect with uh, their family member who now has some um, cognitive impairments? And so in my work and working with family caregivers, um, we've also looked to see what are the sort of adapting coping, adaptive coping strategies that family caregivers have used to be able to 
um, engage with um, um, their uh, family members and to adjust to this new role that they have. And that includes not only managing these um, the cognitive impairments that come up, but also the physical disability that is related to, um, you know, dementia as the person um, progresses with that disease. And so some of these strategies include uh, spiritual coping, similar to our pain group, the use of past experiences, so things that have got them through in the past, and then a really huge one is information gathering, which unfortunately just often amounts to um, Googling. And then if you don't really know where to begin, it's hard to to really come up with the particular things that you're looking for. And so these are certainly some really important areas of need uh, that we want to continue to um, investigate. And so for the next steps, I'm really interested in investigating the relationships between health and adaptive coping strategies that um, diverse communities are uh, selecting, leveraging technology as a tool to really help with um, some of this education, particularly amongst our intergenerational caregivers. Um, helping to facilitate caregivers to connect with one another through technology because it's such a lonely space for people. And then a huge one is helping people to identify resources that are local to them because uh, particularly when you're aging, and you have new onset and um, it's very different. You're not connected with the disability world and don't have this um, range of experience that comes with just perhaps dealing with aging. And then the final um, piece here is really thinking about community informed intervention and using community based participatory research methods, as well as community engaged methods to be able to make sure that the interventions that we uh, develop to support uh, persons that um, are um, aging with cognitive impairments and pain and other forms of disability um, really have things that they're interested in um, that are sustainable and that are um, um, positive. Um, thank you. And uh, let me take a look here so I can see what. Uh, and Sharia, uh, everyone, thank you very much. Wonderful, exciting presentation. I know you have questions. I want to let folks know that this is officially the start of the five-minute break, okay. but uh, maybe Sharia can answer one or two of the questions if you're willing to stick around. Sure. But we will be starting with the introduction to the keynote speaker at 11.58 and such, but. Okay, will do. Thank you. Um, one of the questions was about whether the strategies are successful because of cultural context or could they transfer over to other communities. Um, I'm sure that many of the strategies may be um, applicable to other uh, communities, but some of the things that we've seen um, different that are unique to Black older adults at this time, um, for example, is the high use of uh, religiosity and um, spirituality um, in, uh, as part of the coping um, process. Um, there's some mixed data on whether or not um, increased spirituality actually has positive or negative um, effects for individuals, but in terms of the sheer um, numbers, if you will, of people who engage in this as part of their um, coping process, um, that is culturally distinct, as well as um, the increased exercise and this idea that you have to um, keep moving, we um, don't frequently see in um, other older adult uh, populations, particularly in pain uh, populations. Um, and so one of the things that I've been working on is uh, really doing a lot of teaching around what it means to do culturally responsive um, care and interventions and helping to understand how do we think about cultural context um, when we're doing interventions and is it necessary to design interventions um, from the beginning with the majority in mind and then modifying them or what might it look like to design interventions that um, really significantly affect um, individuals who don't fall into um, majority um, and then modifying them for everyone else. Thank you. So much. We're going to let people take a, a few minutes break. Hopefully okay. everyone will come back for our key note speaker a little bit before noon. Um, and once again, we will be holding a uh, informal discussion and networking at um, the end of the day at 1240 or so. Uh, sorry, at um, uh, 1240 till about 130. So if you're able 
to stick around. We'll provide a separate link for that conversation. So thank you all so much and we'll welcome you back soon. Welcome everyone. Uh, very excited to, oh, hold on a second, we have to. Hey Michelle, did you, uh, you had a brief comment? I, uh, sorry, I think I sent it to everyone. I just wanted to thank Ted Allaire um, who handled the details for this conference to help make sure everyone was registered, was able to get on, and um, has dealt with the many, the various issues that have come up. So thank you very much, Ted, for all your work. I agree. Thank you, Ted. Really, uh, this has been great. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Thomas Pearson. And I have known Dr. Pearson uh, for a number of years, and uh, he is a, a wonderful mentor of mine, and I'm also a friend of mine as well. Um, and in, he is actually is one of the leading experts in translational research. Um, he is a professor of epidemiology and medicine at the University of Florida Health Science Center. And uh, he is actually mainly focused on um, in the area of epidemiology, prevention of cardiovascular disease with a special interest in prevention and treatment of disorders of lipids and lipid proteins. Um, he has previously been principal investigator and program director for numerous NIH uh, research and training grants, 
um, including a CDC prevention center. And just uh, that was an area where I got involved and had the pleasure of, um, of having him as my mentor and friend. Uh, this was at the National Center for Deaf Health Research at uh, University of Rochester, Rochester, New York. And um, he has also um, has directed clinical and translational science awards. Um, and he currently directs the translational workforce uh, development and KL2 programs um, currently at the University of Florida Clinical Translational Science Institute. So I'd like to go ahead and um, turn it over to Dr. Thomas Pearson. And also, again, thank you for being willing to be our closing speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKee. And I, I just wanted to thank Mike for this invitation. Uh, and, and just to say that um, uh, this is uh, uh, a nice opportunity to, uh, to hopefully discuss uh, some issues. I also wanted to thank Dr. McKee, um, who's recently uh, provided us with a, um, a little recruiting video. Um, he is an alum of the University of, of Florida College of Medicine, his MD degree. Uh, and um, he's helped us uh, really, I, I think, make people aware that we're, we're very encouraging of people with a variety of disabilities to apply to our medical school uh, and, and that um, uh, this would be a very nice opportunity for the continuation of their, uh, their, their professional education. So again, just to thank, thanks for, uh, for Dr. McKee here. So we'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, some new tools uh, to address health disparities in, in disability communities. Um, and uh, ne next slide. Uh, this, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the, the proceedings of a workshop uh, and then a paper published just uh, a little bit ago in uh, July 21st in the Journal of the American Cardi College of Cardiology Journal, um, uh, the um, entitled Precision Health Analytics with Predictive Analytics and Implementation Research. Uh, and there, what we did is try to get across some concepts of some of the new opportunities that are available, given the data and the, and the analytic methods that we have, to start addressing questions that we haven't been able to do that previously, and to bring in some other concepts that I would hope would be meaningful for those of you who are looking at the health of both individuals and communities uh, uh, who are disabled. And so, uh, and you can see here that uh, this was a very distinguished uh, group of um, <clears throat> authors. Uh, again, mostly in this instance, focused on cardiovascular disease because that's what I've done. And this was sponsored by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, a one-day conference um, uh, in uh, Bethesda. Next slide. So I'd like to just talk about four topics today, uh, uh, and uh, and. Oh, the first has to do with with uh, place matters. Is is it the um, uh, genetic code versus the zip code? The complementarity of precision medicine, precision precision public health. These are oftentimes looked at as as opposing uh, ideas. I'm going to try to basically say it's the same idea. Uh, Next, ask the question is, do we have data resources required to assess risk in disability communities and to identify the medical, behavioral, social, and environmental factors mediating uh, that risk? Uh, and the third issue would be to, can we use precision analytics to develop tools that address health disparities in persons and communities with disabilities? And then finally, uh, ask the question, can we prove that these new precision tools are implementable and if they are implemented are the effective in reducing these disparities. So these are some big ideas, um, but hopefully we'll give you some new insights as to where we are. Next slide. So the first, the first point is, is that place matters. We get down to our individual characteristics, et cetera, but where we live matters. And so this is a map um, of, of cardiovascular mortality rates, uh, age standardized across the um, 3,500 counties in the United States. And the only point I wanted to make down here is, is, is that there's a tremendous range just depending on where you live. It goes from 76 per 100,000 um, population deaths from cardiovascular disease to 546. This is an eightfold range. 
And to say that this is all genetics or all of this or all the us, the answer is we don't know why there is these large, other than the fact that place matters and we understand those places. So look at Florida down over here. Um, uh, South Florida looks a whole lot like the Southwest United States. Middle Florida looks a whole lot like uh, New York and New Jersey. And Northern Florida looks a whole lot like the, uh, the Southeast and the Deep South. So even within a state, you have tremendous variability in the, in the leading cause of death. And so we need to understand this, this involvement of communities as well, as well as involvement of individuals. And that's where precision medicine, precision public health come into the discussion. Next slide. So uh, this was from the Kaiser Permanente um, of people and basically say, you know, what are the, the contributors or the, the, the possibilities of preventing um, a premature death? And the answer is, is health is more than clinical care. Uh, and by their surmisement, um, that of, the, of uh, the preventable deaths, about 10% um, uh, medical care uh, contributes and can contribute to reducing premature mortality. Family history and genetics, a bigger part, 30%. The big item here is personal behaviors, the behaviors uh, that we have. And then finally, and oftentimes overlooked or not really attended to, environmental and social factors, another 20%. So the point is, is that um, obviously with personal medical care, uh, clearly that's important, but there's these large, vast areas in which possibly 90% of premature deaths could be addressed much better. Next slide. So I want to introduce the idea of precision public health. Um, it's really been around for about three years. Dr. Mouin Khoury uh, proposed this here in this uh, in this um, this 2016 um, paper, but the idea is that if precision medicine is about providing the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, then precision public health can be simply viewed as providing the right intervention in the right population at the right time. And so we get into again start starting to think about some of our disability populations. Uh, for, for 10 wonderful years, um, we were talking about the uh, deaf and hard of hearing community in Rochester, New York, uh, really a, a community approach rather than a, a bunch of individuals. Next slide. Uh, next slide, sorry. So why can we do that? Why are we developing new precision public health methods? And the answer is, is that we have a lot more data. The amount of data that we have is simply overwhelming. So we have more accurate methods for measuring disease, and pathogens, and exposures, behaviors, susceptibility, and these should allow better assessment of population health and the development of policies and targeted programs for preventing disease. So a lot of the components we need, we, um, we have, we need to put them together um, in terms of addressing health at the community level. Next slide. So this is a uh, paper I wrote a long time ago, really 20 years ago, um, um, but really describes the components of, 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 um, of precision health and, and certainly um, precision public health. Uh, and so what we have are our entire populations. And what we need to do is start thinking about subpopulations and segments of the population. Because we know that some of those populations uh, are early adopters, and some of them are late adopters in terms of new opportunities to improve their health. So I live in a very nice uh, academic neighborhood, a lot of professors, et cetera. I'm in an early adopter community. And if we tell them, we, we, we measure uh, what's going on, um, surveillance, uh, and we tell them what's going on, mass media and education, they spring into action, uh, they assimilate this knowledge, they change their social uh, norms and, and, and want to participate, and behavior change, risk factor change, and morbidity, mortality change then occurs very quickly. We also know that there are other populations in which that doesn't happen. And we call these late adopter communities, um, and, and those are classically um, 
lower SES, rural communities, minority communities, and disability communities. In those communities, uh, a, a, some, some new information, some new therapies, some new opportunities would come. We, we could surveil the population and identify and try to change their knowledge base about that this is a problem for them through mass and local media uh, health education. But then it doesn't take off by itself and correct itself. So what we need to do is, is then um, with the surveillance and education as the beginning, then go on to several other steps to really help those communities adopt. And these are community organization, the, the forming of various um, structures, et cetera, in communities. Uh, the assured health services oftentimes might need to be brought in and a variety of policy and environmental changes. So some, some accommodations, if you will, for late adopter communities, which we still want to get to that behavior change, the risk factor change. But the point of this is, is if you just put something in and don't think about this, the late early adopter communities will take off and the change will occur. The late adopters will stay there were, and then we ask ourselves, why do we have disparities? Uh, and I think there are multiple, multiple examples, certainly in cardiovascular disease, uh, that, that, that we could bring forth as an exp explanation of why we are where we are. And the question is, what are we going to do to fix it? Next slide. So, so we, we have a tremendous uh, number of opportunities for precision public health uh, uh, interventions. And of course, one of them is health-related data collection, um, uh, surveillance, outcomes data uh, to really define and segment communities. Uh, this could be on the basis of their geography, zip code, uh, census tract, uh, also on the dem demographic aspects, age, race, ethnicity, but also their disability status, uh, surveillance and incidence prevalence of, of certain major diseases, morbidity, mortality in terms of disease burden, but also utilization of utilization of healthcare, uh, laboratory data, and other determinants of health. And the message is, is in the last really even five years, the amounts of these data available uh, are just increasingly in, 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 uh, in the logarithmic uh, rates of, of increase. Next slide. So what we've done uh, at the University of Florida, uh, we are the uh, land grant university for the state of uh, Florida. Um, we are the largest um, uh, university uh, in, in many regards, certainly in terms of research and, um, and ranking. And so uh, we have basically uh, decided that we would try to organize some of these data for precision public health, certainly at the at the state level, and we've asked our medical center library to actually be the the um, the aggregator. So what we've done is a list of federal, state, or local level resources um, that could be applied to public health research. Uh, these um, these data are, as you will see, quite variable. But uh, one of the things that links them together. They're, that they're all not just all over the place, but links them together is, is a description of their population and their local specificity. Also the description of, of who's running these, who's accountable for them, and the cost of these data, if any. And just like a library where you pick out a book and get knowledge or from, a, from a, um, uh, uh, some electronic media, we're asking our health science center libraries to also manage this data resource um, and make it available for people to uh, to come and, and get the data that they need. Next slide. We've also put on, you can also uh, get the uh, LibGuide. Um, you can go on this yourself, actually. Um, uh, it's a uh, an open website. So what the LibGuide is, is 120 data resources with an amazing range of of different topics, uh, agriculture, demographic, environmental health statistics, clinical data, community health resources, uh, disease and condition surveillance, health services, uh, 120 data sets. Uh, and some of these data sets are uh, themselves extraordinarily large. For example, we have all the NHAMES uh, surveys, um, particularly with uh, 
with Florida data going way back. Next slide. One of the uh, examples, of just one of the 120, is our One Florida Data Trust. This is another effort at the University of Florida, and I'm sure you have similar kinds of things at the University of Michigan for the, the state of Michigan, yeah, is these are data from um, various healthcare systems and affiliated practices and state agencies from across the 67 counties of Florida. And our database currently has 15.4, let's go back, um, 15.4 uh, million patients of the about 22 million patients in the state of Florida, 4,100 providers, 1,200 practices, 490 million encounters, 250 million uh, medications, 400 million, 480 million laboratory sets. This is one data set from our repository. And the point is, is that again, as it characterized others, is that these are located in time and in place. Uh, and so that's what sets, uh, sets this aside so we can start to temporally and geographically link our exposures. We can tell uh, you the environmental conditions within 20 meters of your house from NASA satellite data relative to weather and, and some um, environmental conditions, for example. So a tremendous kind of a mind-blowing expansion, um, which, which then we can say, what does this have to do? with disabilities, both in terms of etiology, but also um, uh, care and, and services. Next slide. So um, in our interest to surveil and characterize risk and disability populations, you, we can identify uh, uh, by place the disabled communities. We have electronic health records on all these 15.5 million individuals. We also have information about social organizations, et cetera. Many of the databases um, could be used to really uh, identify disability um, uh, individuals and organizations. And then with the collection of, um, of the data, obviously we spent a lot of time on computerizable uh, cases and phenotypes. Uh, so just something easy like Hypertension is actually amazingly complex, and with a, we really need an entire set of rules to make sure that that every place has the same definition of a case of hypertension, for example. Um, we'd also uh, uh, like to uh, promulgate um, disability-friendly surveys and questionnaires at the University of Rochester, the National um, Center for Deaf Health Research. Uh, uh, we developed a, a variety of, of, of deaf and hard of hearing friendly surveys, mostly video based American Sign Language surveys, but even some of the written surveys also with a variety of things to consider um, individual needs um, for people with disability. And then we could, of course, then could uh, link to environmental data by location. So people have a genome, they're linked to their genome but they also have an exposome, which is defined as everything other than the genome. Uh, and so this is the, really the looking at the holistic view of a person's risk. And then of course, the other thing we wanna make sure is we can disseminate and share these results. And of course, some of our communities communicate different um, and we need to make sure that the sharing of results is compatible with their learning. Next slide. So the population segmentation then is very important, is really we want to identify these late adopter communities and, and particularly our disability communities. And of course, this is, this is something that obviously requires a, a good deal of work, a computable cases, phenotypes, which are valid, sensitive, and specific. There are some data on languages used. American Sign Language um, uh, is, a, uh, is a language, of course. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so there's a variety of ways in which we can identify um, not only the diseases and, and th things that people have, but also some of their other characteristics in a disability community. Again, there's this spatial temporal linkage to uh, uh, multiple sources of data on physical, social, and clinical factors. We try to understand then the, the environment that individuals live in, uh, and then segment those communities by burden of disease and the factors which might be um, affecting those diseases, which of 
course, could also include disability. An analysis of them would provide you with the opportunity to look at factors associated with disease, your typical epidemiologic um, look, um, but also to look at racial, ethnic, disability, community disparities, um, and, and as well as the social determinants of health. The results then could be used in, in health education campaigns, community mobilization, a variety of things of those other steps that one needs to do uh, in order to make a late adopter community uh, an adopting community. Next slide. So what we're, we're really doing is, is changing greatly um, precision medicine. Um, so on an individual basis, precision medicine has to do with the right patient, to the, the right treatment, the right patient at the right time. Uh, her whole, whole idea of what their risks are, which used to be you know, health records, now includes genomics, environmental, behavioral, uh, transcriptomics, metabolomics, pharmacoepidemiology, so a lot of individual information about that person. So we can be better at early risk prediction, the differential diagnosis, and the treatment optimization. Uh, you know, pharmacogenomics, for example, identifies people who could respond favorably or unfavorably to a drug, including side effects. And so uh, identify, again, precision, the right drug and the right patient at the right time. And so you're really doing these new phenotypes um, to really to do that. Next slide. But the same thing goes for communities. Uh, we can now identify communities, obviously, are, uh, we're so concerned about on the West Coast, uh, the air quality, for example, disaster areas, uh, new communities in need. Uh, we have obviously nutritional um, areas of, of need, a variety of other kinds of water, and soil, air pollution, uh, issues of racial disparity and, and inequality. And so the, the point is we can get to really the identification of a much broader sense of, of, again, getting the right intervention in the right community at the right time. Next slide. And, and, and what is underlying all of this, of course, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the socio-ecological model, but it is obviously a very well-accepted model uh, for why people uh, behave as they do. And the reason is, is that there's individuals, there's individuals in relationships, like with families and schools. Uh, they belong to part of a community, uh, which has resources, and they're part of a society, which has laws and services, uh, et cetera. Uh, the data types, again, available to us uh, are, are expanding rapidly, uh, and there's some new kinds of data um, that we hadn't used before. Facebook, Instagram, all of the social media, for example, uh, are also tappable in terms of, of, of working with the community. Next slide. So then what we want to do then is ask the question, okay, if we have a disability community, uh, to, of course, the first thing to do is to identify their health outcomes. So we did some early um, uh, behavioral risk actor surveys. Of course, the behavioral risk actor survey in regular communities is done with a telephone survey, uh, totally uh, excluding the deaf and hard of hearing community in most instances. Um, so we did a, um, a, a video-based um, uh, behavioral risk factor survey. In the same community, we, we were doing the regular, our own behavioral risk factor survey, and then could basically look at, you know, what things that the deaf and hard of hearing community appeared to be having relative to different health outcomes. Uh, found several relative to um, uh, a variety of the behavioral issues, um, um, uh, depression, et cetera, uh, interrelated to depression. Um, uh, body weight, um, um, domestic violence, and we were just scratching the surface. But then the question is, why is this? What are the drivers? Um, the deaf and hard of hearing community, obviously with its, with its own languages, et cetera, uh, we, don't, we don't need to fix that. We need to fix the cause of the poor health outcomes. And so with the precision of public health, you can work on the exposures, precision medicine, you can work on the genome. But the point is with this mediation analysis, 
um, you can mathematically identify those things that are creating that association. Next slide. And these get very, uh, so uh, the, 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 the green one here, the, the genetics, obviously a variety of models, some simple linear models, a variety of more complex decision or deep learner models. And with these our receiver operator um, curves here, you can see um, if, if you add things, you get more and more sensitivity um, uh, with the same specificity. Um, you learn more and more about how to identify people. Uh, but the, the point here is, is, is that the, the, um, if you take these demo domains and add them, not just use genetics, or not use behavioral, but actually fuse them together, you do much better from a precision medicine and a precision public health in terms of identifying uh, the risk of those communities. Next slide. So implementation research um, can be done in patients or in populations with disabilities. And this is a whole another um, sort of young area of science as implementation uh, science. But the question is, is the tool, once we come up with these tools, uh, do they, are they effective? Uh, we, we can come up with all sorts of mathematical and behavioral and things, but at the day, end of the day is that do they work? Do they really improve the typical patient, in this case, um, with the disabilities, or for that matter, a whole community with disabilities? So the things you want to look for in terms of asking the question, is the tool or intervention effective? You want it to be associated. You want it to be calibrated. But you also, at the end of the day, when you use this tool, you want to reclassify people that perhaps before said were not at high risk, and now appropriately identify additional people, you want to reclassify them, um, and then that becomes then a useful tool. Next question, is the tool or intervention modifiable for use in disabled persons or communities? Um, uh, and obviously, um, one of the really creative parts with the National Center for Deaf Health Research was to use a variety of things really cr created for a person's uh, who use American Sign Language as the primary um, um, means. And then finally, um, uh, really is, is the implementation science, and that is, is, um, is a modified tool effective uh, in this. And of course, we have done some randomized trials, particularly in the area of, of weight loss, um, and asking that question. Next slide. So, what you're, you're left with is, and, and this is um, a guide for implementation strategies at NHLBI. This is a um, working group that I uh, convened uh, or chaired with um, um, from it, uh, a number of years ago. What you have then is essentially multiple levels. Uh, this is the multi-level implementation strategy and at the policy level, this would be at say a professional society, uh, et cetera. You would also have the um, uh, clinical institution level um, at your hospital or your health science center or whatever. We then, of course, be at the provider level, physicians, nurses, uh, other people, and then, of course, at the patient level. And there's a whole science that we've um, um, uh, kind of reported on here in, um, in circulation uh, a number of years ago. One of the things that our working group did is in what we know very little about is how this all works in various milieus. The social, cultural, and physical environments in which these, these are implemented, we know very little about, despite there being thousands of papers looking at a variety of things on how to implement evidence-based guidelines. So the point is, is that the disability community would be an example. What works in a, a regular clinical population may not work in the disability population, and we need to understand that. Uh, but it also it says that we need the empiric tests um, to carry that out. Next slide. So as I, I, I wrap up here, I just want to talk about um, precision medicine, precision public health. Precision medicine then uses a lot of information. Again, the message here is that these are burgeoning data sets, the genetic information, genomics, 
a whole variety of other uh, kinds of things. These are then analyzed and provide decision support tools. This was um, from uh, Dr. Rob Califf, uh, former uh, FDA commissioner and, uh, and, uh, and cardiologist. Uh, so these decision supports, and then we get these tools that caregivers, patients, and clinicians can use. And this is, again, our improvement of, of, of precision medicine. This has been the lion's share of our focus, I believe, in, in most practice. Next slide. The other approach, of course, is precision public health. Um, and this, of course, uses some different data sets. It might be uh, claims data, electronic health records, social determinants, behavioral and environmental factors. Again, so using these data resources. Again, analytic methods and coming up with, with um, tools for surveillance, health education, and policy support. Uh, and then these are then applied uh, to make sure that their essential health services are provided, that, that we change the community attitudes and, and uh, knowledge norms, uh, and implement appropriate uh, community health programs and policies, appropriate because they work, because implementation science has showed us they work. And the message really is, is that these two in the, in the literature in the, over the last two years have been talked about as opposing and almost competing areas. Instead, next slide, is you can put these together and just say it's all data. Some you can get individual risk analysis, some you can get community analysis, but at the end of the day, you end up with a clinical decision or population decision support you have a variety of audiences uh, to prepare for these. Uh, precision medicine can help learning health systems. Precision public health can help learning health communities. But when we get to precision health, the right treatment for whatever's going on in the right group of people at the right time. And I think this is a, another perspective of how we could use some of these new resources uh, to look at issues of d diversity and disparity. Uh, in disabled populations. Next slide. So the, the challenges, of course, are then, and, and, and there's many opportunities there. And on that last slide, there's just an amazing amount of opportunities. But the challenges are is, is that, you know, extensive amounts and types of data are increasingly available, but they do they include disabled persons, or can we identify persons up from the disability community in those massive data sets? The second is, can inter interventions to mitigate risk be implemented in persons or communities with disabilities? And again, I think that's a study, an implementation study by study, uh, and ones that we need a great deal more of as we in understand working with these communities. And then finally, the analytic tools function as well with persons or communities with disabilities as they are without communities, or do we need new tools? But the point is, is that many of the methodologists are being trained for this, still need to train a bunch more, but there's some uh, very good opportunities. Next slide. I think that's the last slide. And I would hopefully have a, a couple minutes for a, a question and, dis, uh, and discussion, but I, I'm i um, delighted with the opportunity to, to talk with you this noon and, uh, and just uh, again, thank Dr. McKee for, uh, for uh, having me along and um, hopefully we provided you with some kind of um, new uh, ways of thinking about this. Thank you very much, Dr. Pearson. That was a very interesting and important um, presentation about these concepts. And I loved how you brought them together to help us figure out ways. Um, I guess one of the questions I had was about the concept of disability community um, and to the extent that individuals identify as part of it and if they need to, to, um, to be part of tailoring based on community. Well, I think, of course, there's a, a whole variety of different communities. I, I think um, uh, from our experience with the National Center for, for uh, Deaf Health Research, the community was incredibly important in the health of these folks. I mean, they had them together. And so I would suggest, you know, my father was deaf uh, in a town of about 600 in Wisconsin. Uh, there was no community, none. I mean, he was my, the only person. And, and I don't think that's a healthy thing. 
so uh, in Rochester with about 15,000 or so American Sign Language users, you really got to have that social structure. I was very impressed by the, the, the care and the, 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 the healthiness that was have of having that community rather than being out there all by yourself with, with problems that no one understands. And so with research and with healthcare, you need to start understanding those communities um, and maybe even forming them. And clearly, uh, I know with our veterans, for example, um, at the University of Florida, there's a variety of disability groups there, um, both um, military-oriented injuries, as physical injuries, as well as other things. And, you know, the PTSD groups and the, the amputee groups, I think it's important for them to basically know that there's other people like me and people are doing well. It's, it's uh, so I, I think we would want to, if those communities don't exist, we'd like to try to make them. Thank you for that point. Uh, I think we've heard of numerous groups that are, I've heard of them, women with disabilities, not having met other women who use wheelchairs and the importance of that. Currently in the study we're doing, uh, we find that in Detroit, there's a very active disability community where that isn't really present in Flint. Um, and so even within you know, different physical areas, um, that the lack of community definitely leads to less programs, less understanding, and different attitudes, I think, about disability. That little box on my, that old slide that I had was uh -huh. the organization. That's what we're talking about. Yep. Um, and I guess I know, if he's still here, um, Alex Gossage is from the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living. And I guess, Alex, if you're available, and not to put you on the spot, but do you have any thoughts about this idea? Um, actually, I just sat back down, so I thought I thought it was going to be good timing, but I don't um, I don't have a what was the the idea or the question? The idea was just in terms of the the tailoring based on community as well as maybe an individual needs and the idea of creating communities or the importance of addressing the norms and the uh, the characteristics of that community in engaging or creating interventions or tools for them. Um, so I guess when I'm, when I'm thinking about community, and if I'm off base, I do apologize. Um, I think about it in terms of just everybody around us in general. So Ann Arbor, for example, as well as the disability community itself. And I, I think what I've seen in my experience is that um, not only do we have very diverse communities, even as far as going one county up north and one county down south, it's also very different in terms of the disability community in each of those areas. Um, you know, to the extent that here in Ann Arbor, uh, there's a transportation option. Um, it's not the best one, but there is one. Um, west side of Washtenaw County, not, not as well covered, um, as well in the same with the north into Livingston and as well and down into Monroe. And so those kinds of things um, are, are very challenging to have to deal with in that every place is unique. Um, housing is a much bigger crisis here than it is maybe down in Monroe affordable, accessible housing. Um, but so at the same time, hopefully some of these concepts can kind of basically say that um, some funders may say, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, why would we put this transportation system in or these other things? And I think we need to be better advocates, not just because what should be is, is, is that there should be equity and, and fairness and justice. Mm -hmm. That hasn't worked so well, uh, but if you, you know, it should work, but it has. So what we'd rather do is say, this is what we want to do with this. For example, if you could really get some of these community organizations and show functionally how this would really change the game, uh, I think some of that is a, a different, a different kind of advocacy, maybe a little bit more sophisticated and highbrow. But at the same time, I think. You, you know what your endpoints were, and is, are these groups forming? Are these groups interacting? Are people getting feeling supported? And mm -hmm. I, so I, I think it just kind of changes the game a little bit in terms of measurable things, rather than just starting something and say, "Well, I guess I guess that was a success." Um, I, I, thank you both for the perspectives. I like the idea of the interaction between the two and how one definitely influences another. That. 
So Erica Twanzik um, had a good question here um, on the chat uh, early in your presentation, talking about early adopter, late adopter communities. Is it possible that a late adopter community may have a greater distrust of the medical and research systems to do egregious historical events and discriminatory events um, that still happen today? What ways in which can we build trust within those communities? Are you kidding? Of course they are. <laughs> you, you must be, and, 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 and the deaf and hard of hearing community is a good example with, of course, sterilization programs of deaf women. Um, one of the, uh, Dr. McKee, I thought was a landmark study look, looking at um, education versus income in the Rochester deaf community. There's a top two standard deviations, higher education, given the fact that there's a esteemed deaf university there, and two standard deviations below in terms of income. That, that, where else does that happen? <laughs> it almost breaks laws of nature. So the point is, is that many of these are disenfranchised, and I think Mike would agree that uh, having been a healthcare provider to the Rochester community, uh, you know, you walked in there and say, hi, I'm from the healthcare center, I'm here to help you. <laughs> that wasn't exactly the right message. And that's where community-based participatory research gets in, and, 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 and really central was, and I, I think Mike will vouch for this, we, we involve the deaf community in everything. The study design, uh, they collected the data, uh, all the papers were shared with them, so there wasn't something that we didn't really recognize was insulting or demeaning. Um, and, and after a few years of that, um, you kind of got over this thing. Well, this is some, 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 somebody in, in the medical care system. It must be a disaster. Um, and to, rather than saying this is an opportunity um, for further input from us. Uh, and I, I think that was the best part of actually watching this community starting out as really opponents and, and, and ta antagonists. And at the end, having some of the most wonderful partners you could ever have. So, um. thank you so much, Dr. Pearson. Um, it really is, it's a pleasure having you on here, and uh, we you know, really love the uh, the presentation. Just to be able to think um, how we can actually address a lot of the, um, the health inequities that we see with this population, and how we could be more um, more collaborative with the partners in the community. So, I really appreciate that. Um, so I wanted to just let everybody know um, we are going to be moving over to a new link. Um, and if you look at the chat box, there's a, now a lunch networking uh, option so that we can um, all collaborate and, you know, hopefully we can share some further discussions. And, um, and we can also talk a little more about some of the presenters and also with Dr. Pe uh, Pearson's talk as well. So thank you again so much for uh, joining us. Thanks for having me. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming in and being part of this inaugural symposium. Um, once again, you'll be sent evaluations. And if you've been part of this, uh, please fill those out. Also, claim the continuing education. Dr. Pearson, thank you so much for helping tie these ideas, these different fields together to help us all move forward.